Okay, so welcome. This is Paul Skowinski talking. I <laughs> am the Citizen Lake Monitoring Network educator for the UW Extension Lakes program here at UW Stevens Point. I have three other presenters helping out today. So would each of you guys like to introduce yourselves quick? Hi, this is Susan Knight. I work at UW-Madison's Trout Lake Station. Hello, everyone. This is Michelle Nolf. I'm the statewide lakes and reservoir ecologist with the Wisconsin DNR based out of Madison. Hi, everyone. I'm Michaela Krumrai. I work for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources out of Madison as well. And Allie McCulloch will be helping to facilitate the Q&A sections today. <coughs> Allie, do you want to just introduce yourself real quick? Hi, everyone. I'm Allie McCulloch, Lakes and Rivers team leader out of Madison, Wisconsin for the DNR. Great. Thank you, Allie. A uh, few logistics before we get started today. Uh, we have four presenters, as I said. Uh, we ask everybody to keep yourself muted. We will mute people if we see people unmuting. Uh, and please also keep your webcams turned off just to minimize the bandwidth requirements for the meeting today. And uh, if you move your cursor around, you should see the toolbar pop up at the bottom of your screen. And one of those will be the chat. Many of you have already found the chat function, but please use that to type any questions today into the chat box. We will not take live questions. We have Almost 200 people on the call right now. I think a few more will be still joining. Um, so we're going to keep everyone muted, but use the chat box instead. And as I said before, Allie will be taking questions from the chat and bringing them forward to the presenters. We'll have a few minutes for questions after each section of aquatic plants that we talk about today. And then at the end, we'll have another Q&A section for any remaining questions at the very end today. We do expect the webinar to go till 1 o'clock Central Time. So four hours, um, hang in there if you can. It'll be a lot of material, but also keep in mind we're covering actually a fairly small proportion of the aquatic plants of Wisconsin today. Um, so there are a lot more that we could talk about, um, but we, we kind of toned it down for this virtual webinar. And for those of you that can't hear me talking, of course, it doesn't help for me to actually ask you if you can hear me talking. But hopefully they see that on the bottom of the screen. Uh, there is a way to test your speaker and microphone and also swap it if you have a headset and you'd rather send the audio to your headset versus a speaker or something like that. You can do that with the arrow next to the mute button. All right, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Susan Knight to start us off here. Okay, great. Um, I am so pleased to see how many Utricularia fans there, <clears throat> there are out there. So, so that's really wonderful. Um, so I'm going to start us off with a general um, introduction to um, aquatic plants and introduce some of the terminology. And <clears throat> after we do this, we're going to have, excuse me, <clears throat> a series of rotations, just as we would if we were doing this at a live event. Um, at a live event, we would have a bunch of tables set up, usually about nine, and we would split the group into three, and um, uh, a third of you would go to one table and learn about all the plants at that table, and then rotate, and then we would start on another threesome of tables, and then finally another th threesome of tables. So we're going to do it in kind of the same way, that is, we're going to go over every single plant. So um, this first PowerPoint is just to kind of get you familiar with um, some of the uh, jargon that we use and um, just as an introduction. So I think I have to say next, right, Paul? Yes, you can say next and I'll advance for you. Okay, and sometimes I think you will figure out that I'm ready to move on. So, okay, I think so, so next, yeah. Okay, so first of all, um, we want to talk about um, the wonderful resources we have out here. This is an outstanding book by our own Paul Skowinski. Um, it's the fourth edition of his book, Aquatic Plants of the Upper Midwest. It's a photographic field guide um, for our underwater plants, and it is extraordinary. The pictures are just gorgeous. 
It's beautifully laid out. He has pictures not just of the vegetative parts, but the flowers, the fruits, the stipules, anything that's um, relevant for that particular plant. It's really an extraordinary um, resource. Uh, next. We also have Through the Looking Glass, which has been around for uh, about 20 years. It was written by um, Sue Borman, Bob Korth, and um, Joe Tempty about 20 years ago. And it is an illustrated guide. And it is also a wonderful book. Um, the, the drawings are um, very illustrative, and it also has a little bit of information on um, other um, similar species. Well, Paul's book has that too, and um, just a lot of information. Both of these books, this Through the Looking Glass and Paul's book, are available um, for sale through the UW Extension Lakes program. So if you want either of these, um, and I highly suggest you get them both, um, go, go to their website and find it. Okay, next. A couple other books that we use. This is um, a two volume set, Aquatic and Wetland Plants by Crow and Helquist. And um, it's a pretty pricey set of books. Probably, I think um, last time I looked, I think they're about $100 each. So um, anyway, it's very good because every, um, it's comprehensive. It even has all of the sedges, the aquatic sedges. So it's very, um, it's comprehensive and it has keys to everything um, so that you can figure out what you've got. Uh, just packed with information, a huge resource, um, but a little pricey. Next. And um, this is um, uh, Chatty's um, uh, book, Wetland Plants of Wisconsin. He also has a flora of Wisconsin. So um, this is also uh, another great book, uh, probably available in bookstores around. Okay, next, Paul. Okay, so um, Through the Looking Glass is mostly uh, broken up into emergent, submersed, and floating leaf plants. So that's kind of how I organized this um, a long time ago. We are not going to really talk about too many emergent plants today, um, but we are going to talk about the submerged plants, and they are generally divided into plants with finely dissected or thread-like leaves. And you can think of those plants as if you imagine kind of a, um, a maple leaf and you take away all the leafy parts and you're just left with the veins. That's what you get with these finely dissected or thread-like leaves. Then there are plants with smooth leaf edges. Um, another group is the opposite or world or alternate leaves. So how they're actually, the leaves are held on the plant. Uh, can be a big help, and it's another one of the divisions within Through the Looking Glass. And uh, pondweeds are a huge group of aquatic plants. We have about 30 species, and I'll be talking about them quite a bit more. Some of them have broad, and some of them have narrow leaves. Some of them have floating leaves. Some of them have glands. We'll talk more about glands and stipules, which are very helpful for identifying different species. Uh, we'll also talk about turions. Turions are overwintering, usually overwintering buds, although curly leaf pondweed has a turion to make it through the hottest part of the summer. And a lot of the aquatic plants have these. We'll talk about those. We'll talk about flowers and um, fruits of these plants. And finally, we'll also talk about plants known as rosettes. And I apologize, I haven't been very consistent about what these plants are called, the rosettes. Um, they usually, most of them have their leaves or their stems coming in a bunch right from the base, but I've also in some places called them isoides, um, and that's named after the genus Isoides. So uh, hopefully that isn't too confusing. Rosettes, Isoides, same thing. Okay, next. So here are a few emergent plants. I'm sure you're all familiar with these. Um, the first is on the upper left is arrowhead. Um, uh, Sagittaria has, you, really pretty white flowers, doesn't flower all the time. The uh, leaf is almost always emergent, although there is um, one species that has floating leaves, but they spend a lot of their time as sterile rosettes underwater. So um, I think Michaela is going to cover um, the arrowhead submerged form um, uh, later on. Pickerel weed, another plant that is emergent, has a beautiful plume of purple flowers around here up in the north woods, uh, not flowering quite yet, but the, the plants are definitely up. It also has a submersed form, uh, a little less common than the arrowhead. 
And then the bottom left, you've got cattails. I'm sure everybody knows about cattails. Three-way sedge, one of my favorite plants. When you look at it from up above, you can see that the plant, the leaves all come off at a 120 degree angle from each other. And then soft stem bulrush, um, all the bulrushes. These are just some examples of emergent plants with um, broad or narrow leaves. Next. Um, some of the floating leaf plants that we have here um, include water shield, which is one of my favorites. I saw it was somebody else's favorite too. Uh, it has uh, these football shaped leaves with a stem coming in from underneath. Um, spatter dock is uh, one of the yellow pond lilies and it has these heart shaped leaves. Um, Martweed down there in the bottom left is, um, has floating leaves and has this beautiful plume of pink flowers. In the bottom right, we have uh, whitewater um, pond lily and or fragrant pond lily uh, it, that has much more rounded leaves and then finally we've got uh, a bunch of duckweeds that are um, uh, there are several species of duckweeds. Next. These are the rosettes that I said are also um, uh, commonly known as isoidids. These guys are stiff and tough and often evergreen. The leaves come from the base of the plant you're usually going to find them on sandy or wave swept shores, usually in low nutrient waters, but if the water is fairly nutrient rich, it will be sandy or wave swept. Generally, they're unrelated to each other and mostly they're in Northern Wisconsin or they're especially common in Northern Wisconsin, I guess I should say. Um, another big group of plants are the submerged plants with finely divided leaves. These are the plants that I was talking about before that if, like a maple leaf, you take away the leafy parts and all you're left with are the veins. These plants are all dicots. A um, couple of examples of those are coontail, very common throughout the state. Um, on the right, I have world water milfoil. All the water milfoils, um, well, most of the water milfoils have kind of the same body plan with um, these feather-like leaves. And uh, bottom left, we have water marigold, one of, another one of my favorites a very highly branched leaf that is just um, branched and branched and branched and branched and in these uh, tiers of leaves and looks underwater very much like a bottle brush, very fluffy looking. And then finally we have the common bladderwort, uh, which <coughs> is uh, uh, one of um, one of the favorites of lots of you and I'll be talking a little bit more about those later. Okay. So um, here is a close-up of the bladderwort. Um, so this is one leaf of the bladderwort that you can see up in the upper left. And you can see um, uh, that there's a, a, this is one bladder and the bladder is a little hollow sack of plant material. And I know most of you probably already know this, but I'm gonna go through it anyway, um, that it's a little hollow sack that's filled with water, of course, because it's underwater and um, the, the little bladder is attached at one end and it's open at the other end and the open end has a little trap door. And the trap door opens um, at the bottom and it's hinged at the top. And the uh, bladder actively uses energy to pump the water from inside the bladder to outside so that it actually gets in kind of a squeezed in look like you would if you had just eaten a lemon and your cheeks are kind of squeezed in. And so the pressure is very low inside and very great outside. The bladder also has little trigger hairs around that trap door. You might be able to see them faintly. They're, they're really just about transparent, but they look kind of like the appendages on a zooplankton, like a clodosin or a coke pod. Um, and if those get tweaked just a little bit from uh, animals moving along the plant. And most of the animals that you would see kind of congregating around a bladder where it would be uh, zooplankton, such as clodocerans and copepods and ostracods, and, or you might see mites, or you might see little um, uh, insect uh, larvae, especially little midges. And those kind of animals are always crawling around this vegetation. And if they bump into these trigger hairs a couple of times, the bladder will fire and it'll go and suck the animal right in. The trap door opens and shuts in a tiny fraction of a second and the animal is trapped inside. You can see down in the bottom right, you can see that there's a pretty good size 
insect larvae of some kind that's been trapped by the bladder. And what's gonna happen is those animals are, uh, the bladder will run out of oxygen and the animal will die and will start to decompose just from all the bacteria that came in with that animal. The products of decomposition like the nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, all that yummy stuff will be um, absorbed by the plant. And uh, the plant bladderworts, um, like coontail, do not have any roots. So the nutrients are constantly being used by the actively growing vegetation or being shunted up towards the growing tip of the plant. The plant is always growing at one end and it's dying at the other. Okay, next. So some other uh, submerged plants with finely divided leaves include the water milfoils. As I said, almost all of them, with one exception, have this same body plan where they've got a long stem with these feather-like leaves. Each one of those um, in the one on the left is uh, Eurasian water milfoil, and the one on the right is Northern water milfoil. And these um, have, both of these have four leaves at each node, and each leaf is like a feather with a central rachis and little leaflets going off to the, the side. So this is a very common uh, body plan. Okay, next. Um, a lot of our submerged plants don't have that um, lacy-like leaf or finely dissected leaf. They have smooth edges, and that includes Elodea, uh, wild celery, and all of the pond weeds. Next. And the leaf arrangement is also diagnostic for these different plants. Some of them have opposite leaves, like this little um, gradiola or um, dwarf um, water pert and, or golden pert, and some of them have world leaves. And when world means that there's more than two at a node, so uh, that includes Elodea here, which have these little propeller like leaves. And then, of course, it also includes the water milfoils that have four leaves at a node. Next. Um, pond weeds are another big group and they have alternate leaves. Um, they're not the only ones, but they are, and sometimes it's really obvious that their leaves are, ob that are, their leaves are um, alternate. For example, on the left we have white stem pondweed, Ponmigeton prelongus, and on the right we have fern leaf pondweed, Ponmigeton rubensii. Next. A lot of these plants um, produce showy flowers, but almost all of them are angiosperms. That means that they're flowering plants and so they all produce flowers. They don't all have showy flowers. I'll show you some more in a minute, but some of them do. The bladderworts um, are um, particularly showy. Um, for example, this is the common bladderwort up in the upper left with these beautiful yellow flowers. Um, large purple bladderwort and small purple bladderwort, as you might imagine, have purple flowers. Very, very pretty. And the water marigold is actually in the marigold family or in the aster family and it has these um, beautiful bright yellow um, aster-like flowers. Next. So the poor pond weeds are a little less conspicuous. They have uh, a sort of these dull olive brownish colored um, uh, flowers, but they, are, um, but they are flowers and they, rather than the showy ones, which are almost certainly pollinated by bees and other things, other insects. These are the pondweed flowers and the water milfoils down below are probably wind pollinated. So, um, but they do produce flowers and they do produce nutlets. And these are also very helpful for identifying the plants. The uh, Eurasian and the Northern water milfoil flowers look an awful lot alike. So that's not hugely helpful for you for um, distinguishing them. Uh, one of the milfoils actually has flowers and fruits underwater along the stem. So that is quite a bit different. If you see a water milfoil and it's got a, a flower or fruit under, underwater along the stem, then you know that you've got Farwell's water milfoil. Next. Turions are another feature of aquatic plants. These are vegetative, usually overwintering organs, um, but not always overwintering. For example, the, the curly leaf pondweed right down there in the bottom uh, has a very hard nut, uh, almost like a pine, little chunk of a pine cone um, turion. And this is um, usually produced in um, mid-June to late June, and they fall off the plant, and the plant pretty much gives up the ghost around mid early to mid-July, and so this turion is how the plant makes it through the summer. 
But that's kind of the exception to the rule. Most of the pond weeds and the water milfoils and the bladderworts all have turions that help them make it through the winter. So you see on the left, we've got water, water I'm sorry, world water milfoil with these club-like um, turions. And the turions are just a, um, an ex sort of an embellishment of the already growing tip. The new, the leaves that make up the turion are not hugely different from the original leaves, but they've got more starch, they're less uh, finely dissected, um, and they, um, the bladderworts, anyway, they don't have any, the leaves that make up the bladderwort turion don't have any bladders. The leaves are less dissected, they're very starchy, and um, they get a bit of a mucilage all around the, the that would probably, that probably helps protect them through the, um, uh, through the winter. So um, these turions are very important for helping these aquatic plants make it from one season to the next, for the most part, making it through the winter. Um, and there, I can't really think that there's much of a corollary on land. So this is a kind of typical of aquatic plants and not so typical of terrestrial plants. Next. All right, now I want to spend a little time talking about pond weeds. We have about 30 species, and these can be a little tricky to tell apart. Some of them are easy, like you've got uh, large leaf pond weed on the left, and you've got sago on the right. Well, there's no doubt that those are two different plants. Okay, next. So some of the things that you have to look for um, is that, again, there are about 30 species. There's a, there are two genera, Ponemogeton and Stachenia. And uh, for a long time, Stachenia was a, was a Ponemogeton, but now it's separated. And the, um, um, there's only one Stachenia that's common. There are a couple others in the state, but Stachenia pectinata, which is Sago pondweed, is by far the most common um, in the state. And then there are another, a bunch of Potomagetan. I'm not gonna talk, we're not gonna talk about all 30 species here today, but we'll talk about a bunch of them. They all have alternate leaves. Um, it's not always super easy to tell that, but uh, generally they do. And then from then on, um, the plants are kind of all over the board. The leaves can be broad or they can be narrow and almost like a thread. Uh, they can have floating leaves or not floating leaves. Sometimes they have both. Sometimes they have a petiole, which is a little leaf stalk, or sometimes they're clasping. Sometimes they have glands, which are these little doorknob-like structures on the stem at the base of the leaves. We'll see some pictures of those eventually. And stipules. Uh, stipules are little leafy bits that are um, attached to the stem and sometimes attached to the leaf. And some of them have winter buds and some of them have nutlets. So whatever combination of characteristics they have, uh, you need to use all those characteristics in order to identify which pond weed you have. Next. So um, again, the, um, they have alternate leaves. And so uh, an example of that is this white stem pond weed or, or Ponemogeton prey longus. Next. Sometimes the leaves are broad, like in the Potomogeton amplifolius or large leaf pond weed, that's often also called cabbage. Um, or sometimes they're very narrow. This is a leafy pond weed um, or Potomogeton foliosis, and this isn't even as narrow as they get. Next. Some of the plants have floating leaves only, or for all intents and purposes, only floating leaves. That includes um, floating leaf pond weed aptly named, uh, Ponemogeton natans, and some of them only have submersed leaves, for example, Fry's pondweed. And some of them have both. Um, an example of this is variable pondweed or Ponemogeton gramineus. And this can be very frustrating to um, try to use as a key because even if they could have floating leaves, they don't always. And so um, you often will, if you're using a key, and it says has floating leaves, you might have to follow the key in two different directions. One, assuming they do have floating leaves and one assuming they don't because you don't always see the floating leaves. It was, it is a confusing feature. Next. Um, sometimes the leaves are clasping and hugging the stem and that can be very distinctive, especially for example, this, uh, uh, clasping leaf pondweed, Ponemogeton richardsonii, or sometimes there's a little bit of a petiole, uh, such as this uh, Ponemogeton amplifolius. So that will also be um, 
help you in uh, figuring out what you've got. Next plan, next slide. So I need to spend a little time talking about stipules. Stipules are little bits of leafy tissue right where the leaf meets the stem. And sometimes they're free, meaning the stipule is attached to and often hugging the stem, but not attached to the leaf. And sometimes they're adnate. Adnate is just a fancy word for attached. It means that the stipule is attached to the leaf at least part of the stipule's length. And um, that may be a hard feature to um, understand unless I were, you know, somebody was standing there showing it to you. But basically what you have to look for is a little fringe or a tab on the leaf. And if you see something just kind of randomly sticking up, it's probably a stipule. Um, in a few species of Potomogeton, the stipule is attached to a leaf a very short way. There are only a couple of um, pondweeds, two common, two very uncommon, and in Stachinia, actually, the stipule is attached to the leaf quite a long ways. Next. So here are a couple of um, diagrams of the stipule. This is Potomogeton pusillus on the left, and the stipule is that really transparent, you can just barely see some veins in it. So you can see that it's um, originally, it probably was a leaf, and now it probably serves as protection as the leaf is developing or the flowers are developing. But at any rate, this one is free. And you can tell because if you go right down to the base of that little stipule, you can see that it's attached to the stem. And um, uh, Fry's pondweed to the right, you can also see just barely its stipule. It's actually hugging the stem pretty much, but it is not attached to the leaf. It's just attached. And if you gave that a tug, you would see that it's kind of slit down the middle. Imagine a, a button shirt where you've unbuttoned it and you can pull it open if you wanted to. So it's um, usually uh, can come apart from the stem very easily if it's not attached to the stem. Next. Okay, so Potomogeton rubinzii or fern leaf pondweed is one of the pondweeds that has very conspicuous attached stipules. So um, I'm going to, you see where it says pull leaf. If you pull the leaf there and you look where it says look here, you're going to see um, in the next slide that as you pull the leaf apart, the leaf is down there in the bottom sort of southwest corner of the picture now and that leafy translucent kind of fibrousy looking thing is the um, attached is the stipule and it was attached to this to the leaf and the stem all the way down you can see that it's kind of light brown there down at the base where it's attached near the stem um, but the stipule that little free portion that's not attached to the leaf and it's not attached to the stem anymore it's just kind of free that is uh, an indication that you had an attached stipule. Next. Another example is Potomogeton spirillus. Next. That plant um, also has leaves and the stipule is inconspicuous until you tug on the leaf. Next. So you can pull the leaf and look where it says look here. And you do that and you can see uh, the leaf has been pulled away from the stem now and that little fringy bit that's sticking up that is the attached stipule uh, with a little fringe on top. So Potomogeton spirillus is one of those that has that attached stipule. If you have a leaf, if you have a plant that has a leaf, you know, maybe one, two, three millimeters wide and you see that little uh, fringy bit it's probably Potomogeton spirillus, and there are a couple of others that you have to change, check, but it's probably spirillus. If it were much bigger, or maybe up to five millimeters wide, it's probably fern leaf pondweed. Next. So, um, uh, okay, that's all right, we'll just go on. Um, oh, actually, go back, Paul, sorry, thanks. Um, just to finish up with um, Potomogeton spirillus or spiral fruited pondweed, the stipule is attached for just a few millimeters and the free portion is only one to two millimeters. So these are small features and it would always help to have a hand lens. Okay, next. So um, there are only three common pondweeds with the attached stipule and that includes fern leaf pondweed that we talked about before, the spiral fruited pondweed, and the sago pondweed. And I don't 
have a good picture of the sago pondweed um, stipule, so I'm sorry that I can't show you that. But there are two rarer fine leaf pondweeds, um, Pondweedium bicupulatus and diversifolius, that also have an attached stipule. But if you can identify this feature, then you have instantly narrowed down whatever plant you've got hugely. So it's very handy to know how to identify a, an attached stipule. Okay, next. Another feature are winter buds. We talked about those a little bit before. Uh, these aren't the best um, drawings. Um, the photo that I had of Potomagetan crispus or uh, curly leaf pondweed was probably better than this diagram. Um, Fry's pondweed, I'm gonna, we're gonna see another picture of. Um, those turions are quite distinctive and not really done justice in this diagram. Um, but a few of the other plants have uh, pretty prominent stipules, I'm sorry, winter buds. For example, Zostroformis, which is also flat stem pondweed. Um, big and conspicuous and often seen um, at the bottom of the plant while it's growing in the new growing season and then early, fairly early in the season will produce new turions. Um, so it's possible to pull up a plant and see an old turion at the base and a new tur turion up at the top. Also, um, looking at the bottom of this um, diagram, there are nutlets, and some of the nutlets are uh, quite distinctive, like spirillus, I'm sorry, um, um, uh, pusillus is very smooth. It doesn't have any bumps or anything like that. And some of the others, like ponogate and foliosis, leafy pondweed, has very bumpy ones. So, okay, next. Thanks, Paul. Um, these, uh, again, this is the curly leaf pondweed. This um, almost woody sort of tough little turion that um, uh, can make it over uh, uh, over the summer really and produced by early mid sometime in June and falls off the plants and this is what will sprout again in the fall and the plants will kind of hang out all winter and then just charge into um, start uh, growing like crazy as soon as the there's enough light in the spring, maybe when the ice goes out. Um, on the right, I have a, a close-up of the Fry's Pondweed. You can see a lot of people think it looks kind of like a fan because the leaves are kind of uh, spread out a bit. And this is very distinctive when you see this. Um, and uh, Leafy Pondweed will produce these turions pretty early in the summer. And so you should be able to see them, maybe not quite the 1st of July, but certainly by mid-July, um, leafy pondweed will show its pondweeds, or will show its uh, turions. Next. Okay, so then you've got a bunch of uh, plants and you've got to sort of put all these different features together. So here is an example of spiral fruited pondweed, seen it a few times. Um, it has narrow leaves. Um, so it falls into that narrow leaf um, section. Um, the stipules are attached to short ways. So if you can figure that out, tug on a leaf and see that little tab flip up, then you'll know that you've got the stipule. And then you've got um, nutlets. And these um, nutlets are um, in a little cluster right at the base, right in, um, at the base of where the leaf uh, leaves the stem and they have a ridged keel, and so they're very bumpy looking and quite distinctive. Next. Um, in the fern leaf pondweed, the leaves are a little bit broader, probably up to about five millimeters or so. The stipule is attached to short ways. I showed you pictures of that before, so give that leaf a tug and see what pops up. And the leaves are quite stiff, so all of these features, the breadth of the leaves, the stipule, and, the, and how stiff the plant is will all be helpful in um, diagnosing what plant you've got. Next. Uh, curly leaf pondweed, probably everybody knows this plant. The, the plant, the leaves look like miniature lasagna noodles. So that's distinctive. Um, the leaves are also serrate, which is very important early in the spring because you don't always have those lasagna noodle-like form early in the spring, but the leaves are almost are pretty much always serrate. It looks like a saw blade right on the edge. Um, and they're often gone by mid-July. And this, of course, is an invasive exotic. Next. Um, the pondweeds also have lacunae, which are empty cells. And some of uh, the keys will refer to lacunae as empty cells along the midrib. Sometimes they'll say um, one to four rows of lacunae, which I don't think is 
too helpful, or sometimes it'll say zero to four. So if it doesn't have any, then you're not gonna see any. So, um, but anyway, it's good to be aware that some of these plants do have conspicuous empty cells um, uh, right along the midrib. Another feature that is really important are these nodal glands that are pictured down here in the bottom. And those are um, little oil glands right at the base of a leaf. Again, like the attached stipule, only a few pondweeds have these glands. So if you can see them, you've narrowed down which plant you have tremendously. Next. Here are a couple of pictures. For example, two um, examples of uh, plants with glands are Fry's pondweed, Pondagetan Frysii, and Pondagetan pusillus. And the glands are those little um, knobs on either side of the leaf that you can see kind of look like, you know, the, I don't know, whatever those things were coming out of Frankenstein's neck or Frankenstein's monster's neck. Um, so, and these are oil glands, and according to Dr. Freckman, who's um, researched these and looked at them, they can be big or little depending on how well the plant is doing. So they might be pretty big and robust if the plant is doing well and it's storing some extra energy in the form of oils at these glands, or they might be um, kind of small. At any rate, um, probably, Sometimes you can see them with the naked eye, but it is a lot easier to see them with a hand lens. And um, the, gland, the, um, the glands are often quite sharp, so they're not sort of blobby looking. They're usually fairly uh, clear. You can usually see them fairly clearly. Next. And, um, this is a leafy pond with Pondagetan foliosis, it does not have glands. And this is the best way to tell foliosis from pusillus or leafy pondweed from small pondweed. So if you look down, you do not see any little glands sticking out to the side. They're just smooth all the way down. And that is um, unlike Pondagetan pusillus. And uh, unless you have fruits, um, there are some other features, but these two plants can be pretty hard to tell apart. Next. Okay, um, just wrapping up a few invasive exotics that um, we have had. Um, well, we've seen um, hydrilla in one part of Wisconsin. I don't think we've seen it for quite some time. We managed to get rid of it by pretty much paving over the pond where it showed up. Yellow floating heart has been seen in a couple of places. Uh, Paul, I believe, has been uh, worked hard to eradicate that from some of the uh, places where it's been found. And uh, frog bit up in the top right and water chestnut, I don't think have been found in Wisconsin, but they're very common in the Northeast and um, everybody should be on the lookout for them. Okay, next, I think that's it. Okay, before um, I turn it over to, um, um, I don't know if it's Michelle or Michaela talking about large pond weeds, I just wanted to make a brief mention. You guys got some handouts um, that Paul sent and um, I probably, uh, before we start, I don't know if you have time, but we do include what we call our plant ID notes. And um, in each of those, there's a little photo, a, uh, the name of the plant in um, uh, the common name and the Latin name. And um, also um, uh, uh, some information about where you can find it in uh, Paul's book and where you can find it in Through the Looking Glass. And um, anyway, and then some notes if you want to take them. So that is, uh, was one of the handouts that uh, Paul sent you that you could print off. Another handout you got was mostly put together with me by me, and this is just for future reference. One of the things that you might find useful is there is kind of a cheat sheet to the pondweeds, um, including um, the narrow leaf pondweeds. So, um, Anyway, hopefully those are helpful to you. And I am going to uh, mute myself and we'll proceed on to the, uh, the large pond weeds. And then we will have little time for discussion after each little section. Yep, so we do have five minutes for questions for Susan. If there are any questions, please put them into the chat. Um, I do see Leonard's comment about the handouts. The handouts were sent out on Monday night, and I tried to send them out again to anyone who registered since Monday night uh, this morning, 
that the email wouldn't go out. So I will try again, as soon as I'm done with my portion here, I'll try to send that out to the, the recent registrants again. So I apologize for that, if you don't have them yet. Allie, did you want to just run through a couple of questions that have come through so far in the chat? Uh, yeah, I think we've been handling them in the chat, but I'm happy to review what people have been asking. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, sure. Um, well, we had a question about Turions, and somebody was asking, you know, whether or not having a Turion was um, exclusive to the pond weeds. Um, oh. And yeah, go ahead, Susan. Oh, well, you could have answered that too. <laughs> but um, no, they certainly aren't. Um, we'll see later that. The bladderworts have really conspicuous turions. Um, uh, even water marigold has a turion. I don't see it as often, but it is not um, unique to the pond weeds. Thanks, Susan. And and if you could, could you just briefly highlight again what the uh, thought of the purpose of the oil glands is? So according to Dr. Freckman, the oil glands are kind of like your little love handles that you may have developed during COVID on your hips. Um, so little places where um, extra reserves are stored so that the plant will have um, some extra energy later. That's what he determined. And um, so they can kind of come in, they don't go away completely, but they can be large-ish or small-ish uh, depending on how well the plant is doing, whether or not it's getting enough light and photosynthesizing well and all that kind of thing. Um, also, I don't think I said this, but if you have um, glands, you have them at the base of every leaf. You're, they're not just at the base of one leaf. And they're um, usually on both sides of the stem. But you do have to look at a lot of leaves. So um, it's possible that they won't be on one leaf and they will be on another. But generally, if you're looking at, for example, Potomagetan pusillus or Potomagetan um, uh, Frisii or something like that, you will see those little glands um, at the base of every leaf. Yeah, and how, what's the best way to see them? Do you need a magnifying glass? Are there any techniques that can help you? Because they are pretty small. They are really small. I always have a hand lens. My eyes are getting pretty bad. Um, sometimes if I hold them up and I point to them, people say, oh yeah, I can see them if you look at them in silhouette. But you, um, it's probably easiest to use a hand lens and you're always going to be looking at the stem right where the leaf leaves the stem. And you might want to twist the stem so that you can look at it um, either end on or from the side in different directions so that, you, so that they can kind of pop out at you. But a hand lens, um, I'll just uh, say a hand lens, like a 10x uh, hand lens, um, they're pretty inexpensive. Um, and I like the Coddington style, but they're pretty available um, around, I mean, you can get one for less than $5 or you can spend $20, but they're not too expensive. And um, go, don't go out in the field without one, I would say. Yeah, fair enough. Um, this might be more appropriate for Paul, but could you speak to how this material could be accessed or available after the webinar, Paul? Yeah, so this is being recorded and it will be posted to our Extension Lakes YouTube channel within a couple of days. So as long as you registered for the webinar, which you obviously did if you're here, you will receive an email from me in a couple of days that says the recording is now available and it'll give you a direct link to the recording. So feel free to watch it again or share it with others if you know others that might be interested in viewing it. Yep, and um, a couple questions on kind of content and structure. Um, we will be talking about Eurasian water milfoil uh, with the milfoil group, so no worries there. But I had an additional question about blue-green algae blooms and whether or not we'll be covering that. Yeah, algae are, uh, it's another topic that we sometimes do dive into as a breakout session during these workshops when they're in person. We were not planning on talking about algae other than the macro algae, which is Cara and Nitella and other related groups like that. So the, the blue greens or the filamentous algae, planktonic algae, we are not planning on covering that today because we just can't talk about everything in such a short time period. Yeah, fantastic, Paul. And Bradley, uh, with respect to management, we're not going to get much into kind of applied management questions, um, but I'm happy to follow up with you and provide you a contact if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Phragmites. 
Um, I think that catches us up, Paul. All right, great. Thank you very much, Allie. And uh, I'll just mention real quick about hand lenses. I have one that's about a $45 Bosch and Loam hand lens, which is the first one that I got. But I also found one on Amazon that was about 15 bucks for uh, the same size and same magnification, but it has an LED ring light built into it, which is extremely helpful. If you're, if you have a plant on a tabletop or someplace that there isn't a lot of light and you get your lens right up next to it like you should with an, an inch or two in between, you block out a lot of light and it's really nice to have that little ring light in there to illuminate your, your specimen. So I would highly recommend if you don't have one yet, but you're looking at getting one, look for one with a ring light built into it. It has either two or three LEDs or it may have a ring of many more LEDs on it, but it's just really helpful to have. So uh, moving on to the large pond weeds, you heard Susan talk about some of the typical characteristics of pond weeds that are important like glands and stipules and things like that. With the large pond weeds, you really don't have to worry about glands at all because none of them have glands and the stipules are somewhat important, um, although none of them are adnate. So there's, it's a little bit of an easier group that's often very easy to distinguish even just by looking at it from many feet away. So one thing that you do need to know with the large pond weeds or any of them is how to see how many veins it has in the leaf. And these veins are the lines that you see on the screen running from left to right, from the base of the leaf to the tip of the leaf and they all run parallel. You can see in this species there are a couple of cross veins in there, but when we're counting veins we're looking at the ones that are parallel from the base of the leaf to the tip and we're counting all of the veins all the way across the leaf, including that thick one in the middle which is called the mid vein. This is clasping leaf pondweed, Potomagetan richardsonii, which is also the one that you see uh, behind me on this side. Um, it is a, a really pretty aquatic plant. It's a fairly common species across the state of Wisconsin and other states around us as well. And to practice counting up the veins here, this is what you should see. Eight veins on one side. They tend to be symmetrical, so we have uh, what we assume is eight on the other side, and then we have one in the middle, which is the mid vein. So we have 17 total. And this species has 13 to 33 veins in total depending on how large the plant is. If the veins, or sorry, if the leaves are very large because the plant is a very large mature plant that's doing very well, it will have more veins. If it's a younger plant or one that is not as well fed, it will have closer to the 13 mark. So here's one of our very common aquatic uh, large pond weeds in the uh, aquatic plants. This one is often called musky weed or bass weed or cabbage by fishermen. Uh, it is a very large plant. These leaves can be seven, eight, nine inches long and they often have a very strong curve to them as you can see in the lower right section of that first photo. Um, they often curve very strongly and that's an easy way to recognize them in the field. They also have very large stipules that are up to 12 centimeters long. So 12 centimeters is about five inches. Um, very, very large stipules. And those stipules also have two ridges on them, uh, which is important because as Susan said, we have about 30 species of pondweed in the state, but there are only three species that have these two ridges on the stipule. And uh, picture the stipule having a flat top and then rounded sides and bottom. So on the, on the top, it's perfectly flat and then it drops at about 90 degrees on the sides of the stipule. So you end up with these, these strong, sharp angles on each side of the top side of the stipule. So only large leaf pondweed and Illinois pondweed and variable pondweed have that characteristic. So as Susan said, sometimes you find one characteristic that really narrows it down to a small group of plants um, or pondweeds in particular. And that's another one of those characteristics that you might notice in the field when you pull one of these up. So this is a, a common species mostly in our mesotrophic and oligotrophic lakes. As you get into very nutrient rich or very eutrophic lakes, you don't see it as much. So in Wisconsin, we tend to have more large leaf pondweed in the central part of the state and the northern part of the state where the lakes are a little bit less loaded with nutrients. 
And here's a shot of the veins of the leaf. And you can see a lot of veins in there. This one will have at least 19, but it can have way more than that, three dozen or more easily. And again, it depends on the size of the leaf. So if you counted this one, uh, I'm gonna start counting on the left side here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. We'll assume 13 on the other side, which would give us 26 plus the mid vein is 27. All right, another one that looks kind of similar to that, occasionally having curved leaves, as you can see on the left side, um, is Illinois pondweed. And this is another native species to uh, pretty much the entire Midwest. Um, and it has leaves that are almost as large as large leaf pondweed. So what you're looking for is a difference in the number of veins and a difference in the size of the stipules. So the stipules are still pretty big, but they're, they're smaller. Uh, they get up to about 10 centimeters. Most of the time they're maybe five or six centimeters, so about two inches or so. And the number of veins in one leaf is nine to 19, as opposed to the 19 plus that the large leaf pondweed has. And this one is another uh, common species statewide, but likes hard water and more nutrients. So we do see it very often in the southern part of the state as well. And uh, it's one of our species of pondweeds that has a somewhat different form between nutrient poor lakes and nutrient rich lakes. So it can be very delicate and have pretty small leaves in the north, but have very large leaves that are very tough and thick in the southern lakes. So you really need to uh, rely on the vein counts and the stipule length to tell them apart from the large leaf pondweed or the next species, which is a variable pondweed that I'll talk about in a second. So here's another shot of the veins of Illinois pondweed. And if you count up on the top side, you'll see six, six on the bottom, one in the middle is 13. So then moving on to variable pondweed, this one has small leaves that typically do not curve and they have three to seven veins. So again, even fewer than the Illinois pondweed. So it's easily distinguished from those by the vein count or by the size of the stipules. These are very small stipules on this species, uh, only a couple centimeters in length. And this is another common one statewide, but again has different forms north to south. In the north, in our oligotrophic lakes, it has very small leaves and many of them. In the south, we see variable pondweed with very few leaves that are much, much larger. So again, you're looking for the vein count and the stipules to really help tell which species it is. Then we have curly leaf pondweed. This one, Susan mentioned a little bit already. It has very wavy leaves, although they are not wavy when the plant is very young. And you can see that in the photo on the right. That is a new sprout from a turion, and the leaves are not wavy at all yet. But what you can rely on is that the fact, the fact that the leaf margins are serrate. You can see that in both of the, the center photos. Um, it is a non-native species that is invasive, and the vein count in this one is three to five. And in the bottom photo, or either of those photos, you can see three veins on the lower photo and five veins on the upper photo. Then we have the clasping leaf, which I mentioned before. And again, that's the one that's behind me here on my, my Zoom image. This one has 13 to 33 veins. The waves are, are the, sorry, the leaves are very wavy and they're pointed at the tip. And the leaves will wrap around the stem. Sorry, I, I, that should say leaves tightly wrap stems, um, not stipules. Although the stipules are also typically, um, I guess, wrapping around the stem. So. Never mind what I just said. The, the leaves and stipules tightly wrap the stem. It's called clasping leaf pondweed for the reason that you see in the lower right photo where the, the leaf does wrap most of the way around the stem. Um, the stipules are not fused to the leaves. So they are not that adnate uh, term that Susan mentioned. They are hugging the stem. So you kind of have to scrape them off in order to even see them. Most of the time they're, they're basically invisible unless you really try to find them. The leaves are not serrate. So occasionally we see this one mistaken for curly leaf pondweed because of the wavy appearance of the leaves, but they are not serrated on the edges. So that's the easiest way to tell those two species apart. 
and the leaves do not split at the tip. They are just pointed. And, um, and the next species, I'll mention how that becomes important to tell them apart. So this one here, white stem pondweed, looks kind of like clasping leaf, but the difference is really in that splitting tip. Um, basically what happens is the, the end of the leaf forms a little boat shape that is kind of rigid. And so if you press on that with your fingers, or if you're pressing this plant as a specimen to keep around for a while, you will smash the end of the leaf and it will break those two parts of that rigid boat shape apart. So when they split to the sides, you're left with this little notch that forms at the end of the leaf. So that's an easy way to tell it apart from clasping leaf pondweed. Another thing you could use is the zigzag stem that is very common in white stem pondweed, although it's not always the case. And um, the stipules on white stem tend to be just a little bit separated away from the stem and they tend to be very white. So that's where the white stem pondweed name comes from. Um, the stipules on the clasping leaf that we talked about on the last slide will be very fibrous and typically closely hugging the stem where you can't even see them. Okay, so we have four minutes for questions on large leaf pondweeds and then we'll turn it over to Michelle here for the medium pondweeds. Um, I see a few questions. Allie, if you'd like to read those. Sure. Um, Joe, I asked you a clarifying question about the stipules, but uh, maybe Paul, if you could just kind of reiterate, um, you know, the where we see stipules and some of the characteristics that stipules of Illinois um, share with other species. Okay, so the stipules are located where the leaf meets the stem. And again, on all these large pondweeds that I just talked about, they are all free, they are not adnate, so they are, the stipules are not fused to the leaves at all. And you'll always find them where the leaf meets the stem. Um, I did mention how Illinois pondweed, variable pondweed, and large leaf pondweed are the three that have the two ridges or two keels on the top side of the stipule. So that's an important characteristic. And um, I would encourage you to always have a little ruler with you for measuring those stipules. Uh, if you have my book handy, it has a ruler on the, on the edge of the inside cover, mostly for the purpose of measuring pondweed stipules. Um, yeah, you'll hear more about stipules and some adnate stipules and other characteristics as Michelle and Michaela get into the, the other pondweeds, or sorry, Michelle and Susan. Cereals. Thank you, Paul. Um, okay, we have a really interesting uh, physiological question. Does water temperature dictate growth of curly leaf pondweed? We don't usually see invasive growth until later spring and early summer. Yeah, curly leaf pondweed has a, uh, actually prefers cold water, but it doesn't grow really quickly in cold water. Most things don't, the metabolism really slows down. And so when we get more nutrients flushed in by spring rains and we get warmer temperatures and it speeds up the metabolism of, of many things in the lake, not just curly leaf pondweed, but curly leaf having an early start on everything else really has a big advantage in the spring and is able to grow very quickly compared to other plants that are just getting started from a seed or from a turion in the early season. So uh, curly leaf often dominates if it is a dominant species in a lake, it tends to be very abundant and grows very fast in the early season compared to other species. Thanks, Paul. Okay, we have one more minute left and I think we are caught up on questions. All right, I did see uh, somebody had asked about the hand lens that I recommended. If you- Oh, the, yes, the link. I, what I, I did this a couple of days ago for someone else who was asking about a hand lens and just went to Amazon and typed in 10X hand lens LED. And you'll come up with several that are similar to what I just talked about where they have various kinds of ring lights built into them. So again, 10X hand lens LED should get you to what you need. So it's 10 o'clock and we'll move on and, and push this over to Michelle for the next section. All right, great, Paul. Well, thanks for getting us kicked off here. Um, 
So the next group of pond weeds we're going to talk about are ones that we generally call the medium pond weeds. Um, these have leaves that are a little bit narrower and uh, typically a little bit shorter than some of the ones that Paul just talked about, but they're not quite as small as some of the small pond weeds, which will be our last group that we talk about after this. So go ahead. All right, so the first species we're going to talk about is longleaf pondweed or Potomagetan nidosus. Um, this is a species that has, um, as the common name suggests, very long lance shaped leaves. The leaves are about half an inch to an inch wide and they can be up to a foot long, so very, very long leaves. Um, the leaves are attached to the stem along a very leaf, long leaf stalk, which is known as a petiole. And I think you can see my mouse here in this picture. Um, so here's the leaf stem itself. And this long part right here is that petiole or that leaf stalk. Um, that leaf stalk can be, um, again, almost as long as the leaf itself. So while some other pond weeds that Paul discussed may have a little bit of a petiole that holds the leaf off, this one has a very long portion. Longleaf pondweed also has the ability to form floating leaves. And when it does form these floating leaves, they look somewhat similar to these submerged leaves. So again, you have these long lance-shaped leaves that are held by this very long petiole, and these float on the water surface. Um, these floating leaves um, probably help with some of the environments that this plant is found in. Um, many times it's found in flowing waters, and it's somewhat tolerant of, of turbid or stained conditions. Um, these floating leaves kind of help buoy that plant so it doesn't, um, you know, completely get under the water and it can also help take in light and carbon dioxide. Uh, this plant flowers and when it does flower, it has a tiny flower stalk that sticks out of the water column. And again, these floating leaves can kind of help hold that plant up so that the flower can get pollinated. Um, someone in the comment earlier today about talking about the favorite plant um, said uh, this one was their favorite plant because it's equally happy in lakes or rivers, just like them. And I thought that was a pretty good description of this uh, particular species. All right, go ahead. So the next plant I'm going to talk about is fern pondweed. Um, this one is also oftentimes called robin's pondweed, and the scientific name is Potomagetan robinzii. Um, this plant is a, a very stiff and sturdy plant. Um, many of our aquatic plants, when you pull them out of the water, they're very limp. Um, many of the plant features fall down on themselves because they need that water column to kind of hold their leaves out. Um, that's not the case with this particular plant. Um, you can hold it out um, and it looks like a fern and it, it really holds its own without the weight of the water. Um, it has alternate leaves like all of our pond weeds. Um, with a very strongly two-ranked appearance. Uh, you'll notice that the leaves and, and the color of this plant isn't really bright green. Um, many times this plant is a, a very brownish or an olive green color, and it actually will sort of go dormant as the season starts to cool off. Um, portions of this plant tend to just overwinter at the lake bottom, and then the following season the plant will just start to regrow off of last year's stem. This is one of our few pondweeds that has an attached or adnate stipule. And you can see here in this photo um, that uh, someone is basically gently tugging this leaf away from the stem. And as they tug that leaf away, you'll notice this fibrous part right here that's kind of attached to the leaf itself. Um, and this is that stipule. Um, and as I mentioned, most of our pondweeds have free stipules but the fern pondweed has a very conspicuous attached stipule. Um, this species is also a little bit different in where it likes to grow in lakes. Many of our pondweeds like to uh, root in the bottom of the lake and more or less just shoot up towards the surface of the lake. Uh, that's where the light is and that's where they want to be. Um, however, the fern pondweed is pretty content just hanging out in deeper waters of lakes. Um, oftentimes you won't see this plant from the water surface at all. Um, you might have to toss down a rake or maybe pull up an anchor in deeper waters. And when it does grow in these lakes, in these deep areas, it forms very low-lying colonies. Um, oftentimes when you find this plant, you find lots of this plant. Um, and again, well below the water surface. Uh, this plant does not form any floating leaves. Um, and uh, 
yeah, it also does not have any turions. All right, go ahead. So the next species I'll talk about is flat stem pondweed or Potamogeton zostriformis. Um, this is a very common plant that's really found uh, anywhere you are in the state. Um, as the common name again suggests, flat stem pondweed has a very strongly flattened stem. And you'll also notice here in this photo that it has um, somewhat of an angled appearance. Every time it hits one of these nodes where a leaf comes off, the stem tends to just slightly turn um, a, a little bit, giving it that more of a, a zigzag look to it. The leaves of flat stem pondweed are, are relatively narrow. Um, they're only two to five millimeters wide. And they do have a very prominent mid vein that runs down the center of the leaf. Um, they do also have very numerous fine veins and you may even need a hand lens to see all these other veins that surround that prominent mid vein. Uh, as Susan mentioned uh, a little bit in her introduction, flat stem pondweed uh, has very um, conspicuous and large turions that are formed. Um, and in this bottom photo here, you can see an image of those turions. Um, many time in early season, you'll find these turions are actually attached to the bottom of the plant. And the new plant growth is coming off of this turion that was deposited the previous season. Um, about midway through the summer, you'll start seeing these turions formed at the top of the plants, as well as any of the leaf axes as well. Okay. And then the next species we'll uh, discuss is alpine pondweed or Potamogene alpinus. Um, unlike the flat stem pondweed, this is a relatively infrequently encountered species, uh, primarily located in some of our water bodies in northern Wisconsin. Uh, it has very delicate leaves. Uh, most of our aquatics have these sort of translucent uh, uh, leaves, but the leaves of alpine pondweeds are very delicate, almost like a tissue paper consistency. Uh, color can vary quite a bit in aquatic plants, but this species is often a light brown or a sort of a reddish green color. Uh, this reddish color is especially evident if you dry this plant. Oftentimes it'll get that uh, kind of red-brown hue to it. The leaves attach directly to the stem, and so they're not held off by a petiole or any sort of leaf stalk. Uh, the number of veins for these species typically ranges between nine, or excuse me, seven to nine veins. And oftentimes you can see along this mid vein there is a couple of rows of these lacunae or hollow cells um, that kind of buffer that mid vein on both sides. This is a species that can produce floating leaves and the few times that I have encountered this, I have found it with floating leaves present. Um, although like Susan said earlier, um, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll always find those on the species. Okay. And then the last one in our, our medium pondweed category is the floating leaf pondweed, or Potamogeton natans. Um, again, this is a pretty common species found anywhere in the state and can tolerate a wide range of environmental conditions. As the common name suggests, floating leaf pondweed has these very obvious floating leaves that sit on the water surface. And the submersed leaves are um, more or less just these long stalk-like blades, and they really lack any sort of leafy materials that all of our other pondweeds have below the water surface. So this species is more or less just these floating leaf pondweed uh, leaves at the surface. At the base of this leaf, um, you'll notice that it's slightly heart-shaped, so it tends to curve um, a little bit where it attaches to the stem. And that portion where the stem attaches to the leaf is bent at a, a 90 degree right angle. And it tends to have a little bit of a discolored look to it compared to the rest of the stem. So you'll notice that this is a little bit paler um, for about a centimeter or two before this brighter green portion of the stem starts. All right, and I think that's the last one I had for the medium pondweeds. Thank you, Michelle. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, somebody was kind of asking about the format of the handouts. It doesn't exactly match the order in which we're covering the plants, um, but someone was asking, you know, they see a section for large and small, but is there a section for medium pondweeds in the handout? 
Yeah, I just looked at it and I, I see what she means. There are a couple that are missing uh, the, the fern pond weed and um, at least one other one we're missing from the packet. So sorry about that. There, there are indeed a couple missing. Okay, and then the other question um, refers to depth range. So where, where in the lake, at what depth does Potomagetan rubinzii or fern, fern leaf pond weed prefer to grow? Yeah, so the, the fern leaf pond weed, um, as I mentioned, tends to grow deeper in lakes. Um, in general, uh, aquatic plants and where they grow in lakes is dependent on water clarity and how much light penetration can get um, to the lake bottom where these plants are rooted and begin to grow. Um, so the specific depth that a pond weed grows in a lake is, is gonna be very dependent on the water clarity within that lake. Um, you know, most of these pond weeds can grow anywhere from the near shore area out towards deeper waters. Um, we've just noticed that with this largely, or excuse me, the fern pond weed, um, more often than not, it wants to be deeper than some of the other pond weeds we encounter. Great. And then um, clarifying question, what is the best characteristic to differentiate between Potomgate nidosis and natans? Sure. Um, so the one that kind of comes to mind is that the, the potomy and nidosis, um, you know, it, it has those long submerged leaves that have that, that leaf stalk or petiole, but it has an actual leaf blade. Um, that blade has numerous veins and it, it's, um, you know, much more similar to the other pond weeds that have true leaves, I guess you could say. Um, with the potomy and natans, even though it technically has leaves, um, it's not kind of what you might think of for a typical pondweed leaf. It's, it's more or less just a, a narrow skinny stalk that's, that's left from that plant. So with natans, you'll just find those floating leaves. Where with nidosis, you might find those floating leaves, but you'll also find those real true submersed leaves below. Thanks, Michelle. I believe that catches us up. All right, so we'll move on to the small pond weeds back with Susan. Okay, so um, with these uh, small pond weeds, um, the features that you need to check out are the ones that I talked about in the general introduction and that everybody, um, are they're not as um, featured as prominently in the large and medium sized pond weeds. So that includes the glands that we talked about that have those little bumps on the sides of where the leaf leaves the stem. You have to look for attached stipules and you have to look for nutlets and you have to count the veins. And there are lots more or quite a few more species um, that are, have these narrow leaves than are discussed here. And um, but the, the ones that we are, um, that I am going to discuss here are all quite common. So really we've just left out the rarer ones. So hopefully that will be um, good. Okay, next. Okay, um, I really apologize. This is a horrible picture. I actually have a beautiful picture of Potomagetan epihydris or ribbon leaf pondweed that I um, neglected to um, put into here. But this is one of my favorite plants. Um, it actually almost would fit in with um, the medium sized pond weeds. The leaves are half, um, half a centimeter to one centimeter wide. And um, they're very long and ribbony as the common name suggests. And they have five to 13 veins. Some of them are very, very fine. Um, I think one of the key features of this plant is when you, um, rub the leaves together, they feel slippery or kind of silky. Um, another feature of this that you can't really see in this picture is that they also have a very prominent midvein and those empty sort of lacunar cells that we've been talking about um, is very prominent. So you can definitely see different regions on the leaf and the middle section is a lot paler than the outer section. Um, that slipperiness, um, uh, rubbing the leaves together, I think is quite um, distinctive as well. Um, it's often in darker water and it can have floating leaves, um, although I mostly see them without floating leaves until much later in the season. Okay, next. 
Um, water stargrass is actually not a pond weed at all. And it's a, kind of a nondescript, I would say it's kind of a plant made by committee. Um, it is not a pond weed. Um, and of course the plant identification is mostly based on their flowers. So the flowers are quite different. Um, in fact, I've never seen this plant flower, but it is called water stargrass. It has a pretty little flower if you're lucky enough to see it flower. But um, it does look like a lot of pond weeds um, in that it has narrow, dark green leaves. The biggest difference is that it does not have a midrib. It does have veins, but um, there'll be lots of parallel veins throughout the entire leaf, and you will not see one vein um, that is prominent in the middle. So that um, un all the other pond weeds do have a midrib. Um, early in the season, if you're out in early June, um, at least up around here, the new leaves are attached to old stems and the old stems are usually very black. And so the contrast between the black stem and the bright green new leaves is quite striking. And you can almost instantly know, oh, well, there's, uh, there's water star grass. It's uh, very distinctive. So the biggest feature is no midrib and especially early in the season, the new bright green vegetation attached to old black stems. Next. Small pond weed, um, again, these little pond weeds are not all that photogenic. Um, so uh, it has narrow leaves, as you might imagine, one to two millimeters wide. It usually, it can have one to three veins, but it usually, in my experience, has three veins. The stipules are free, so they're attached to the stem, the stem but they are not attached to the leaf. Um, there are, it does have glands. So here's another picture of the glands that I showed earlier um, with those little um, knobs, like little doorknobs on either side of a door um, attached to the stem right where the leaf leaves the stem. Um, there are two subspecies with uh, different placements of nutlets, but generally when we're talking about Potomagetan pusillus, um, we don't always try and distinguish the, the subspecies. And one of them was um, decided to be a whole separate species. And it seems like the um, taxonomists are going kind of back and forth on that. So for now, um, I'm, I'm sticking with pusillus, plain and simple. It's easier. They don't always, you don't always have leaf uh, nutlets. And so it can be really hard uh, to tell them apart. Um, the nutlets, though, um, regardless of um, species or subspecies, are smooth. They don't have any ridges. So if you do have nutlets and you're not sure if you've got this one or the next one, which is leafy pondweed, look at those nutlets. If it's very smooth without any ridges, um, then you've got a small pondweed. And the leaf tip is usually rounded and then with a little tip at the end. So again, the, the key features here are that it usually has three veins. The stipule is free, and there are glands on the stem where the leaf is attached to the stem, and the nutlets are smooth. Next. Leafy pondweed looks an awful lot like uh, small pondweed. The leaves are about the same size, one to two millimeters wide. There are one to five, but usually three veins. There are no glands. So again, look at that photo um, beneath the, the whole plant and see that um, it's very smooth. It doesn't have those little glands sticking out to the side. The stipules are also free on this plant. Um, they, are, they are attached to the stem, but they are not attached to the leaf. The nuts, the nutlets are in little clusters at the end of the stem, um, and, and they are um, very bumpy looking. They're, um, they have these little bumps. I didn't include that on this slide, but they are, the little nutlets have little bumps all over them. And so if you have nutlets and you're not sure if you've got leafy or, or common or small, then just look at those nutlets and the bumpy ones, um, it will be foliosis. Um, and also if, look for glands. No glands, you've got foliosis, you've got glands, you've got pusillus. And the leaf tip is usually pretty pointy. There are some that are pointier, but it's fairly pointy. Next. Um, another common plant, this is a spiral fruited pondweed or Potomagetan spirillus. Again, the leaves are narrow, about a millimeter to two millimeters wide. It usually has one to three veins, in my experience, usually three. Uh, the stipule is attached about two to three millimeters. 
but you need to pull on a leaf to see how the stipule is attached. And I've got that picture that I had showed, shown earlier that shows the leaf being pulled away from the stem and that little fringy bit, that tab sticking up from the leaf tells you, okay, that is the free portion of the stipule and uh, the stipule is attached to the leaf below that, the section that's below the, um, or closer to the stem than that free portion. Um, the leaves are often, oh, I didn't even write this down, but the leaves are often quite curly. And so um, this isn't 100% of the time, but often you will see these, um, the plants and it looks like the, uh, the leaves have been curled. Imagine that you took um, some of that ribbon on a, that you're wrapping a birthday present and you use your scissors to curl those, um, that ribbon and you know how that makes it kind of curly. Well, that's kind of what these leaves often look like. They're often quite um, curled and uh, it can be quite distinctive underwater. Um, so, uh, but it also, it does not have any glands and the nutlets are right in the axles um, near the stem where the leaves go off. So you see this little nest of uh, nutlets and the nutlets have bumpy ridges. So again, the, the key features are um, that the stipule is attached and it's one of the few um, plants um, that has these stipules that are attached. As I think I said, there are a couple of other rare plants where that's the case, um, but if it's got uh, these leaves that are about one millimeter wide, one to three veins, then like, very likely you've got spiral fruited pondweed. And um, okay, next. The next one is Fry's pondweed, um, one of my favorite pondweeds. It has this um, narrow leaves, again, but wider than pusillus or foliosus almost always. So they're two to three millimeters wide. Um, they usually have five veins and the outer two veins will be very fine. So you really need that uh, high hand lens, especially like Paul said, if you've got one with a light, that's really great. Um, you have to look carefully. The glands are quite conspicuous, so it has glands just like small pondweed. The stipules are free. Um, a really good characteristic for this is that the turion looks kind of like a fan. You can see that inset there that um, the, the leaves are kind of, um, or the leaves of this turion are kind of spreading, and so it looks almost like a fan, and it does form these turions fairly early in the summer, at least probably by mid-July, and so you can often see them. Um, so that's very distinctive. And then um, the, there is another uh, bottom picture. Can we go back one? Thanks, Paul. Um, the, again, you've got those glands that are quite conspicuous on Fry's pondweed. So next one. Uh, the last plant we've got here is Sago pondweed. This is Stachinia pectinata. This again is a different genus. And um, I don't really have a good picture to show you how the stipule is attached, but that basically is what makes this a Stachinia instead of a pectinata. The leaves are thread-like. They are very, very narrow. Um, they are highly branched and spreading. So it looks very, very bushy. Um, the stipule is attached for more than a centimeter often. And if you can see one of those leaves, if you pulled, you gave a tug at that stipule, you would see that the uh, stipule is attached to the leaf quite a ways. And then there's a little free portion that sticks up as a little tab or a little fringe. Um, it often has little clusters of nutlets separated on the stalks like pearls on a string. So maybe you can look down there at the bottom and see those little um, nutlets and they're separated by a um, part of the stalk. And so they do kind of look like uh, pearls on a string. These uh, nutlets, by the way, are hugely favored by waterfowl and some um, animals, you know, when they're found, they, they'll, they're, their stomachs are just filled with these little nutlets. So they're very nutritious. It's a, uh, an interesting plant. It is very tolerant of turbidity, um, but it is found in the North and not especially in turbid conditions. So um, I see it not super common, but um, I think it is found throughout the state. Um, again, leaves are very, very fine, highly branched, and the stipule is conspicuously attached to the stem. Okay, I think that's it. Next. Yep. 
Thanks, Susan. Um, that's great. I, I think that thin leaf pondweeds is one of those groups uh, by which aquatic plant taxon taxonomists kind of measure their proficiency. That's to, <laughs> to say they're a, they can be difficult. Um, so thanks they, for that very, very challenging explanation. Yeah, um, I do have a couple of questions. While you were talking about um, pucillus and transitioning to foliosis, Anne asked, what time of the year do the nutlets appear? Hmm. Um, well, for one thing, they don't always appear, period. Um, so you're not necessarily going to see them. Um, I would say um, maybe late July or so, not super early. Um, if Paul or if any of you others that are presenting have a different opinion, I would, I would be interested to hear it. I would, I would say I don't have any firm answer on that. Yeah, I think late July is, is a good estimate for northern Wisconsin, where Susan's at. Uh, if you're in southern Wisconsin, you might see some a couple of weeks earlier. But I would say, uh, yeah, mid to late July, or if you're far north, maybe uh, into early August. Climate matters. Uh, Kathy asks, about turion morph morphology, uh, morphology. Um, does anyone know if Ponum gaten pucillus and foliosis have distinctive differences in their turions? Um, again, I'll I'll let anybody else chime in here, but I would say that they're not hugely distinctive. It's in the keys, I believe, that foliosis does not usually form turions, but um, I don't think that's true. So I'm going to ignore that. Um, I would say that the, um, the pucillus ones I would describe as looking kind of like little cigars, kind of tightly enrolled leaves, but not hugely distinctive. Um, and I, I would say, um, but I'm going, to, I'm going to end there before I get myself in trouble and see if <laughs> Paul or anybody else has a firm answer on the difference between pucillus and foliosis turions. I don't think there's a difference either. Uh, I agree with Susan that pucillus fairly commonly produces turions, foliosis rarely does, but in both cases it looks very much like a small rolled up cigar, um, maybe two centimeters, one and a half centimeters, something like that in length. Um, I don't really think there's any major difference between the two in, in size or appearance though. Thanks, Paul. Um, okay, we have a question about uh, morphology and then also about depth preferences. So Donna asks, does Potomagetan pucillus grow in, uh, grow long and stringy at the surface? I have often seen it growing in a real tangled mass, not far from the surface. Um, so I would say it can grow, I wouldn't say right up at the surface, um, but uh, it's, it can grow into huge, huge masses so that if you put your rake in, you're gonna come up with a bushel basket of it and not necessarily that deep. But um, I'm, I don't have a firm sense on how deep it will grow, but I have seen it up close to the surface. I'll leave it at yeah. that. Great. And then with foliosis and pucillus, is foliosis primarily is found in more shallow water and pucillus a little deeper? Well, I'm cheating and looking at Paul's book and he says foliosis is found in shallow water. And if I'm going to look at pucillus and admit that I'm cheating here, uh, he says shallow to deep. So there you go. Right from Paul, who, who, knows, who knows more than I do. So great. Um, Caitlin asks a really interesting question. Um, you know, I think it's it's always good to kind of pull the plant when you're looking at characteristics because they can vary along a particular plant. But she specifically asks about counting veins. Will the number vary from the bottom to the top of the plant? Is there a better plant part of the plant to count the veins from? Hmm. Um, I, I guess my my first impression would be count many leaves. So look at many leaves um, and I would, you start at the top, they're going to be um, the freshest and probably the most distinctive and possibly the least cover, covered with epiphytes. So 
I would look at the freshest, newest leaves, but don't look at, you know, sort of incipient leaves, little tiny ones. As you get um, further down, um, they, they might just get more tattered. So I would say the best idea is to look at a bunch, maybe five, and count the veins on at least five. Anybody else want to chime in with a thought there? I would agree. Yeah, me too. Okay, and then last question, quick. Um, the picture of Sago, the turion looked similar to Fry's. If you just found a turion not attached to a plant, what's the best way to tell them apart? Did I have a photo of a Sago turion? I, I don't think so, but maybe we can I, go back to that slide quick. Yeah, can you go back, Paul? Sure. I don't think they have turions. Mm -hmm. I don't think so either. So um, I, that it may have looked like a turion, but that is the whole plant. So um, and the turion, if you can go back a little bit to fries, and also in Paul's book, he has a beautiful um, photo of uh, the fries um, turion. So it's very much uh, those little I don't know what you call them, the parts of the turion that are off to the side are quite papery and white looking and um, a, a different color. And so anyway, I don't, I do not Clarification, believe- Clarification, Susan. Uh, yeah. Flat stem, not Sago. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, flat stem, um, that was, I think, Michelle's picture. And um, it is, I would say that in, in flat stem, the leaves of the turion, if you call them leaves, I'm not exactly what, sure what they are, they're all sturdy and tough and green. And the fries, they're sort of tapered and some of them are shorter than others and they're white. And so when you see them in person, they look really, really different, I would say. And the, um, the fries pondweed turion is probably about two centimeters, maybe about an inch maybe a little bit more. And the um, a flat stem pondweed is probably more like four inches, or not four inches, like five or six centimeters, maybe three inches. So they're much, much bigger and much sturdier. Maybe Michelle wants to chime in on the flat stem turion. Yeah, Susan, I think you covered it well. You know, the, the size difference, uh, certainly flat stem having a larger turion than, than the fries. Um, that, that fan shape is pretty, you know, obvious in that fries with that kind of white papery look to it. Um, another way to tell those two apart is that the fries pondweed um, has pretty obvious glands um, and the flat stem does not have glands. So um, sometimes, young flat stem, you know, isn't quite as robust as it is later in the season. So it's another characteristic you can look at to tell those two apart. And one other thing about the turion is that uh, fries is the only pondweed that has a turion in two planes. So those whitish leaves that Susan and Michelle mentioned are basically in the plane of your computer screen right now. And the outer leaves that are longer are going into and out of your monitor. So they're 90 degrees from each other. There are long ones facing one direction and shorter leaves going 90 degrees from that. Thank you. Let's continue. All right, so right now we have a break scheduled until 1040. So um, just hang tight and we'll get started with the water milfoils next at 1040.
Okay, we're back. It's 1040, so we'll keep going with the water milfoils next. So this is a group that gives people a lot of trouble sometimes. So I'm going to go through a few of the characteristics of the group first and different traits that are helpful for telling them apart. And then we'll get into some individual species of that genus Myriophyllum. So one of the first things to look for is the number of leaflets in an individual leaf. The leaves of most of the milfoil species tend to be in whorls of four or more. And you need to isolate one leaf and then count the number of leaflet divisions in each leaf to help determine the species. So on the, the upper photo there, you see a Eurasian water milfoil whorl of four leaves. And on the lower photo, you see an isolated leaf of a northern water milfoil. So what we're counting is the number of pairs of leaflets on one leaf. And if you count up one side of that leaf, you'll be counting up the number of pairs. So on the left side, I'll count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So one of the magic numbers we use a lot with the milfoil genus is the number 12. And northern milfoil has far fewer than 12. So that would certainly fall into that category. And there's a Eurasian water milfoil leaf. If you were to isolate one leaf from the whorl, you could count that and you tend to see more than 12 on that species. Another really helpful characteristic, if you have them, is the floral bracts. And these are modified leaves that are underneath the floral uh, structures. So the flowers and the fruits of the milfoils, there are these small bract leaves. And um, in most of the species, these are emergent. So they're poking out of the water. You have these little flower spikes that are a few inches tall above the water surface. And you get these very reduced, very thick, waxy bract leaves underneath the flowers and the fruits. The top photo is world water milfoil, Myriophyllum verticillatum. And that species has a very highly divided, highly lobed floral bract. So that's a very distinct characteristic. And again, it's if you have them. So it's late enough in the season that they're actually producing flowers. And uh, assuming they're in good condition, you can see those, those characteristics. So you don't always have floral bracts to work with, but they're really nice if you do. The photo on the lower, uh, in the lower part of the screen is the various leaved water milfoil. That one has very large floral bracts. They are not divided at all, but they're very, very large and they are much longer than the flowers or the fruits themselves. So the length and the design of the floral bract can be really helpful. Stem color can be important as well. On the lower left, that one is a world water milfoil again. And then we have Eurasian milfoil uh, in the center picture, which has a, a pinkish color to the stem quite often. And on the right is the typical tan, uh, very light color of the northern water milfoil stem. And whether the leaves are whirled or scattered is very important. The, the left photo is Eurasian water milfoil. That one tends to have leaves that are always in very strict whorls of four or more. And on the right, you see a various leaved water milfoil, which is one of a couple species within the genus that has scattered leaves in some areas of the stem. So parts of the stem will be completely whirled and other parts will have scattered leaves like this where they may be coming off individually, it may be more alternate, it may be in pairs, but basically the whorls start to fall apart for short sections of the stem. So getting to Eurasian water milfoil first, you can see an example of the flower spike on the upper left. That is typical uh, appearance for most of the milfoil species. It looks very similar to that. Um, on the lower left, you see a typical growth habit of Eurasian milfoil. It tends to grow to the surface very quickly and then spread out over the top and continue growing laterally uh, at the water surface. So it can sometimes form these tangled beds of vegetation. And on the right, you see that the leaves are in very strict whorls of at least four and have at least 12 pairs of leaflets per leaf. So if we 
count up the right side here. We can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 pairs of leaflets. Um, you can sort of see the floral bracts on the Eurasian milfoil flower spike. If you look at these, these dark patches right underneath the flowers, those are the floral bracts. So they're very small and basically just circular in Eurasian milfoil and northern milfoil. So again, it's nice to have to help ID with the, to the species if you have the flower spikes being produced. So that would be later in the season, similar to what we were talking about with the nutlet production in the pondweeds. You're looking at probably July. Um, in the southern part of the state, you might see Eurasian milfoil flowering in uh, middle of June, maybe. So the next one is northern water milfoil. This is our most common native species of water milfoil in the state. The Eurasian is our only non-native species. The northern is, is fairly common and you can see a little bit different appearance in that species and that the leaves tend to hold their shape pretty well out of water. They tend to stay spread out from the plant. Um, the leaflets actually tend to stay spread out from each other. And in the lower left, you see a typical growth habit of it in the water. So the plants are quite often single stemmed. They certainly can branch, but they're often growing as single stems and they tend to be pretty bright green and they grow somewhat far apart. So there's, uh, that's, it rarely becomes a nuisance species because there's plenty of room for other plants to grow in there. They don't shade a lot of other species out and uh, plenty of room for a fish or a turtle or anything else to be moving through that vegetation. On the right, you see a typical whorl of northern water milfoil, typically four leaves in a whorl. It can have a couple more occasionally, but it's almost always four. And if you isolate one leaf, you would get far less than 12 pairs of leaflets. It's usually five, six, seven, something like that. And whorl water milfoil is one of our less common native species. It again has those very deeply lobed floral bracts, so extremely helpful. You can also see that the bracts are much longer than the flowers themselves. So those are important characteristics. You see that very dark stem, dark green to brown stem. You can often see that uh, when you're snorkeling or diving near a patch of this, you'll see that dark stem really showing through the foliage. Um, and what you also see in that photo is these club-shaped winter buds. Uh, I think of Fred Flintstone with a club whenever I see these, um, like a baseball bat type shape to them, very distinct in that species. And in the right photo, you can see how tightly packed those leaves are. So there's very little space. We call that the internode distance between one whorl of leaves and the next whorl of leaves. It's very short, a centimeter or less. So the leaves are really packed in there, one whorl after another, uh, makes a very thick looking plant. And then the last one I'm going to talk about, there are a few others in the group that we're not going to cover for the sake of time, but another one that we see fairly commonly in the, the northern oligotrophic lakes of uh, the UP and northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, is the alternate flowered water milfoil. This is a very small species. It's much more delicate than most of the others and tends to be only a centimeter or two across. So it's a very uh, small diameter plant and again has short internode distances as well. So between those whorls is very little stem tissue. So it looks kind of like a thick, narrow diameter rope going through the water that's uh, often very bright green. The leaves tend to be in whorls of three with three to 10 pairs of leaflets on each leaf. And it's called alternate flowered water milfoil because the, the flower spikes are emergent like many of the other species, but instead of the flowers being in whorls, they are alternate along the flower spike. So there's a flower on the left side of the spike and then there's a flower on the right side, left side, right side, and they alternate their way up. All right, so that was it for water milfoils. If there are a few questions about water milfoils, we can take those now and then we'll move on to bladder warts with Susan next. Thank you, Paul. Does anybody have any milfoil questions? Paul, can you cover various leaved water milfoil real quick? Sure. So, various leaved water milfoil is uh, Myriophyllum heterophyllum. 
It is a somewhat common species. We see it occasionally in, in hard water uh, systems in Wisconsin and occasionally in northern more uh, soft water systems as well. Um, that one also has a dark green to brown stem, much like the world water milfoil has. Um, and it has the scattered leaves that, that I showed earlier. I'll pull that slide back up here. Um, this one here on the right side, that's the most distinguishing characteristic of the uh, various leaved water milfoil is those very scattered leaves. So the one you're most likely to distinguish or uh, confuse that with would be the world water milfoil. But world milfoil does not have the scattered sections on the stem. And the other big thing to look for is the floral bracts. So um, again, going back here, here's the two species, the world water milfoil on the upper right with the highly divided floral bract and the various leaf milfoil on the bottom with the undivided floral bract. So you'd be looking for those two features to tell them apart. Thanks, Paul. Um, just curious, can you comment a little bit, maybe just give some general information on the hybrid milfoil that um, has been found in some south, southern Wisconsin lakes? I, I believe they're talking about, I would guess, uh, Spicatum sibiricum hybrid. Right. So we do have a hybrid between the northern water milfoil and the Eurasian milfoil that is, is um, showing up in Wisconsin is, is somewhat common. I'm going to pass this off to Michelle, though, who has much more experience with the hybrid milfoil research. Thanks, Paul. I figured that one was probably coming my way. Um, it's, it's a great question. And uh, to clarify a little bit, the, the hybrid water milfoils have actually been found in all parts of Wisconsin now. It's not just um, known from southern Wisconsin. Um, and as Ali indicated, it's a, it's a hybrid cross between Eurasian and Northern water milfoils. Um, there, there is not a single hybrid genotype out there. Um, these hybrids are actually, uh, they're fertile, so they can actually go on and, and cross with other hybrids or cross with other you know, parent species. So it's a, it's a relatively complex and certainly an emerging area of, of research. Um, there is some evidence that certain hybrid water milfoils uh, may grow more aggressively than, than pure Eurasian or our native northern, um, but not all. And there's also some evidence that um, uh, certain herbicides that we use commonly for milfoil control might not be as effective on certain hybrid water milfoil strains than they have in the past on these pure milfoils. So, um, I'm going to put a link in the chat here in a second uh, to our APM research website and there's all sorts of really great information there about water milfoil management, hybrid uh, testing, um, and it's a great resource for those of you wanting to know more about that topic. Um, had a brief management question. Uh, we have a little bit of time still, Paul. This yeah, we still have a couple of minutes could get interesting. Um, what is the most effective approach to eradicate Euro-Asian and Northern milfoil invasives from your shorefront? I'm going to just throw that at Michelle. Sure. Um, so first to clarify, the, the Eurasian water milfoil is the non-native species. Um, the Northern water milfoil is native and is uh, not typically considered an, an invasive species. So any management of, of milfoil would um, mostly probably want to focus on the Eurasian water milfoil, um, which tends to uh, occasionally cause problems in, in some of our lakes. Um, to date, there are very few, if any, documented cases of actually eradicating Eurasian water milfoil from a water body. Um, there are techniques that are available to help kind of control some of the nuisance conditions that Eurasian water milfoil might uh, um, cause in a, a certain lake. Um, some of those techniques are things like hand removal. That's a pretty easy um, thing to do. Go out and just physically pull it. Um, there's also uh, uh, chemical uh, herbicides that are registered for aquatic use. Um, note that those do require a, a DNR approved permit 
in order to apply in Wisconsin. Uh, I think many other states also have similar regulations. Um, there's also biological controls. There's been some research done um, at a native milfoil weevil um, that's showing um, some potential promise um, at maybe being able to, again, mitigate some of those, those nuisance conditions. Um, in large lakes, some of them also do mechanical harvesting. Um, I think probably the most important part is to work with the, uh, your lake association and the DNR and come up with a, a plan. Um, what are your goals? What, um, what are you trying to control in the lake? And um, how will you assess whether or not you're meeting those goals? And that's the, the most successful approach to trying to manage invasives in, in really any water body. Great, thanks. So just a quick plug. I think WXPR out of Rhinelander is going to be carrying a story on invasive um, Eurasian water milfoil management. It's going to be airing tomorrow. I think you can find it online or in the archives. Uh, Carol Warden and I both contributed to that piece, so we're looking forward to that. Um, there's a lot of things to consider when you're managing aquatic plants. It's it's difficult in lakes. It's, they're hard to see. It's hard to apply herbicide. Some significant challenges. Um, last question, how do these species attach to the substrate? Yeah, so these are all, all the milfoils are rooted aquatic plants, but many of them can also survive as fragments for quite a while. So occasionally you will see them just tangled up on other vegetation and still surviving as a free floating piece of a plant. Uh, at that point, they can typically send out what we call adventitious roots, which form where a, a leaf meets the stem. And those roots can find sediment and then basically uh, establish the plant at a new location. So for the most part, the answer to the question is that they are rooted, they are anchored to the bottom, but can move to other areas of the lake based on uh, just fragmentation. And with that, I think we are caught up and we can we move are. on to bladderworts with Susan. Okay, great. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about bladderworts, and I gave you a little introduction on how the prey capture um, bladders work, so I'm not going to go over that again, um, but just say that uh, there are eight species in Wisconsin. They're all carnivorous, and they all have prey capture traps. Um, none of them have roots, and that kind of feeds into the fact that, so to speak, um, that they rely to one extent or another on um, having the prey uh, serve as their source of nutrients, at least in part. They all have quite showy flowers. Um, six species have yellow flowers and two have purple flowers. And they are related to terrestrial snapdragons. As you can probably see, they kind of look like that. And as I described before, the bladder snap shut with, the, well, maybe I didn't say this, it's the fastest known plant action on earth. The bladders um, open and close in a tiny fraction of a second and it is much faster than, for example, um, that lazy old Venus flytrap or something like that. So, um, and in these um, plants, I'll be talking about leaves, but technically all the leaves are actually stem material. So, um, but we're just gonna call them leaves anyway. So next. Uh, the common bladderwort is the mo by far the most common uh, bladderwort in the state. It's um, known as Utricularia vulgaris or Utricularia macrorhiza. It was renamed macrorhiza by a guy who did um, a treatise on the, on the whole genus, um, but not all herbaria are recognizing that new name. So um, kind of goes back and forth. But at any rate, we'll just call it common bladderwort. It is the largest bladderwort. It can be up to, you know, like a meter or even longer in, in the lake. It doesn't, as I said, it doesn't have any roots. And so it's always just sort of lolling about, um, floating up towards the surface. Um, but because it doesn't have any, any roots, it has to be in pretty quiet water. Although the plant can get kind of tethered by some muck or something, it's usually in very quiet water. So you could have it in a giant lake as long as it had a uh, quiet little bay tucked someplace, and that's where you're going to find it. Um, there are lots and lots of bladders on these leaves. There can be hundreds on one leaf. 
um, or there might be just a few, but pretty much every leaf is going to have bladders unless the plant is really growing someplace it's, it's not happy. It frequently flowers. And um, so you can often see these uh, flowers. I often see it flower, especially when it's clearly someplace that's gotten very warm. Like you might see a um, around the north this year where there's so much water in little, um, they're bigger than ditches, but not quite water bodies that would get a name, um, where they're growing in just really a few inches of water. That's where you're really gonna see them flowering really frequently, someplace where it's really warm. And here um, is the turion, unlike, uh, just as somebody asked a question earlier, are only, do only pondweeds have turions? And here is the bladderwort turion, looks a lot like a little green boxing glove. Um, the little uh, thumb of the boxing glove is actually, was actually a branch when the plant turned into a turion. And so what happened was that the, you can kind of see that the growing tip almost looks like a, a turion. It's a, got a lot of leaves kind of packed in close together, but the turion, you know, doubles down on that. The leaves are very much filled with starch. If you peeled back one of those leaves in the turion, you'd see that they're much wider than the, than a normal leaf. The, um, the little sections, um, they're not quite so thread-like. They're a little bit wider and um, they're really packed in there tight, tight, tight. And then they get kind of a mucilage all over the, um, the surface. So um, you've got these little boxing gloves that are going to overwinter and they'll either get stuck in the ice or they'll sink to the bottom. Sometimes you might see a little bit of the trailing stem, but at the end of the year, all the leaves will fall off, all the bladders for sure fall off, and the plant might have a little bit of a stalk sticking out of it, but pretty much you've just got the bladder. And then in the spring, it will kind of sprout. So you'll, those, um, the inner node difference, distance, this, the, the bit of stem that's in between the leaves will elongate. And so early in the, in the spring, you can actually see these old turion leaves um, they look quite different from the new leaves. They don't have any bladders and they're wider, um, but very shortly you'll start to see um, the new fresh leaves coming out for the spring and those um, old leaves and old stems um, from the turion will fall off and pretty soon will be not visible. So the plant is constantly during the regular season it is growing at one end and it is dying at the other. So this time of the year, the plants can be getting longer and longer and longer and um, then as summer comes to an end, they'll stop growing so fast and they'll be, still be dying. And so the plant will apparently get shorter and shorter. They will branch every once in a while. And when the uh, dying portion reaches that branch part, well, then you have two plants. So it does, um, although it does have flowers, it will reproduce um, vegetatively very, very commonly by just putting out a branch and having the plant die back to that, um, to that point where the branch is. Next. Okay, so the next one we're gonna talk about is twin-stemmed bladderwort, not at nearly as common as common bladderwort, but it basically looks like a delicate version of the one we were just looking at. The leaves are finer, um, the bladders tend to be a little more transparent, a little more pink, and it's more common in acid waters. I usually see it in bog ponds. Um, and so, but it, it can be found in other places. It can co-occur with the common bladderwort, um, but, um, but not always. So it's got a, a little bit more restricted um, uh, habitat. It does have um, showy flowers um, and hidden flowers. Those hidden flowers are also called, uh, are known as cleistogamous flowers. And cleistogamous means that it makes a little flower bud, but it never opens. Um, it just self-fertilizes, but it can produce seeds. Um, this uh, plant is not the only plant that produces cleistogamous flowers or hidden flowers like this. Uh, violets are known to do that, and impatience does this. So um, it's not unique to bladderworts, but it is um, particularly um, common in Gemniscapa. And the other thing is that I am never 100% sure if I am looking at a wimpy vulgaris or a, or a good, a sturdy little gymnoscapa unless I see those um, cleistogamous flowers or fruits. 
and I, I can't point, but if you look up in um, the, yeah, thank you, Paul. That's the Cleistogamous flower right there. And it's almost always at the junction of the main stem and a branch. So you can see that there's the main stem and there's a branch. That's where you look for these Cleistogamous flowers or fruits. It's hard to tell if it's a flower or fruit at any time because they don't really enlarge a whole lot. Um, and so um, once you find those, then you know for sure that you've got Gymnoscapa. If you don't, um, you need to, um, um, uh, it, it's just a little bit harder to tell. Like I said, the leaves are, are finer and a lot more delicate. Okay, next. So Susan, we're at the yeah. end of the section time, but we're gonna just go through the Q&A five minutes here and let you keep going. Um, and okay. And is when we're supposed to start with the other dissected species with Michaela. Okay, so we'll just skip. A heads up. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so small bladderwort is, um, as it says, small. It's on the same basic body plan as the common and Gemniscapa, but the stems are quite delicate. The leaves only fork a few times, and the last fork in the leaf is often at about a 90 degree angle, so it's quite sp spread. Um, the, the, um, it's fairly inconspicuous, but commonly occurring with common and flat leaf bladderworts, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Next. Um, Utricularia gibba is creeping bladderwort, and this is really small and very, very fine. The stems are extremely delicate. The leaves will fork only once or twice, and there's usually only one bladder per node. It's often in a wadded mass. It, you'll, uh, if you see it, it may look like a tangle of fishing line in the water, and it can be pretty hard. Um, this is a, a photo by Paul, and I imagine that he had to spend quite a bit of time painfully um, uh, spreading this out so that you could see just one plant and not in a tangled mess. Um, if stranded on a on a mud flat, it will flower and it does have a yellow flower. Next. Flat leaf bladderwort is um, uh, pretty easy to identify. This is Utricularia intermedia. The plant structure, the body plan, is different from the common bladderwort. In this plant, you have some stems that are leafy and green. Maybe, Paul, you could point those out as the, the green portion of the, um, of the leaf. And then some stems just have bladders, so that, and they are usually white or transparent. And the reason that they're white or transparent is because they are stuck back in the mud. Um, either um, down, they're down in the mud or on the side of a bank or something like that. And they're catching benthic prey. Um, the, the sediment that they're embedded in is um, going to be quite loose, but they are definitely out of the sunlight. Whereas the leafy stems are green and they are photosynthetic. I often see this growing with a uh, with common bladderwort in the same lake within a meter or so of each other. So very common. And you can also see probably right near the penny on the lower picture and um, up uh, at about, I don't know, one o'clock or so, you can see little turions and the turions are commonly still present well into the summer. And also that one up above where you can see it flowering, that one has just the leafy stems and not any of the bladdery stems, but you can still see the, the turions still attached to that. So next. Large purple bladderwort is um, an interesting plant. Um, it usually has, it also has a different body plan from common bladderwort. These leaves are in whorls of five usually, and the bladders are usually out on the tippy ends of the leaves. The, um, where I see this is usually in soft, low pH water, not necessarily bogs though. Um, so um, it might be kind of boggy around the edge, but they're usually not necessarily just a little bog pond. Um, the interesting thing about this is that it can become a nuisance. Um, I get a lot of complaints, probably everybody gets a lot of complaints about these. They can, especially in the north, um, the, the uh, lake will not apparently have any um, purple bladderwort, and then all of a sudden it's everywhere. And um, I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, um, but uh, it, it, it is commonly, ha it has happened commonly. Um, the turion for this uh, plant is quite different. It doesn't have that big nugget that looks like a boxing glove. Um, it looks more like uh, the, the leaves 
just kind of get thickened and kind of curl up a little bit. It looks kind of like Queen Anne's lace in the fall. Um, and there is a report from Florida, I pursued this myself, that the, um, that the bladder, purple bladderwort may not always be carnivorous. So it may be spreading because it's just good at growing rather than necessarily being carnivorous. Okay, next. Um, so the next one we have is small purple bladderwort. This one is in a petri dish because it is, it has these very fine grass-like leaves. They're actually jointed. If you have a hand lens, you can see that there'll be about three sections to those leaves. The bladders are often, oh, it's so, and these, um, the whole plant is kind of embedded in the sediment. Like I said, they don't have roots, but it can be embedded. And if you can see carefully that some of the plant, part of the plant is white, so that's the plant, part of the plant that is in the sediment, and the green portions are sticking up. And often the bladders are right where you go from the green to the white. So that's where you can often look for bladders. You do need to pull the whole plant up out of the bottom in order to really be sure what you're looking at. And the bladders are quite tiny, but they're, they're fairly abundant, so you shouldn't have any trouble identifying it. It will flower mostly if it gets stranded, um, so the water level goes down. You'll, you can have just a carpet of purple where it had previously been underwater. Next. The last one is the horned bladderwort. This is not, it's sort of aquatic, um, but I usually see it on bog mats. So it, the leaves are grass-like, and the little leaves look a lot like small purple bladderwort, except, of course, the flowers are a different color. And these little um, grass-like leaves are not jointed. So this plant is not very common, and it's pretty much restricted to bog mats, and it's very inconspicuous unless it is flowering. Um, but it has a fabulous scent. So if you're on a bog mat, especially if you're in a kayak or something, and you see a whole bunch of yellow coming right out of the, um, the bog mat, make sure you get your nose in there and give it a sniff because it really does smell great. And I think that's it. All right, so we're gonna okay. move right on to Michaela's section here, other species with dissected leaves. And we'll move a little bit into the q and A. I I think with her slides as well, just make sure she has the 10 minutes that we're allotted to her. So go ahead and Michaela, take it away. Great. Okay, so the first species I'm gonna talk about is Serratophyllum demersum or coontail. Um, this plant is a pretty common species. It's probably the second most common species in Wisconsin. Um, key characteristics uh, is the world leaf arrangement. And all of my slides in the upper right have a little icon of leaf arrangement for a quick reference. So this one is world leaf arrangement and the leaves will branch once or twice. So in the pencil drawing, you can see on the left that it forks only once and on the right, it forks once then twice. Also, um, you might need a hand lens, uh, but the leaves are uh, toothed. Um, and then in my pencil drawing, you can kind of see the like teeth on the leaves. Uh, they are a little exaggerated in the drawing. Um, and then commonly, this species is going to look more like this middle picture where it's gonna be pretty robust um, and stout looking. Um, it can also have more uh, fine or delicate looking leaves. So you're always gonna want to make sure to count uh, the forking. We have another species in Wisconsin, Serratophyllum echinatum, which forks three or four times. Uh, that plant is more delicate than demersum. So again, counting the branching pattern is a like key characteristic for demersum. And then also the apex of the plant uh, has really short internodal distance um, and it will look sort of like an animal tail, which I guess is where it got its common name. And that's like a soft characteristic trait. Uh, this plant does produce flowers. Uh, in that picture, you can see there's a flower in the leaf axle and this plant, uh, it doesn't really flower too often, but if it does flower, it's going to be early spring, or sorry, late spring, early summer. And it also produces fruit, uh, which are like three-pointed fruits. Um, okay, next. 
The next species I'm going to talk about is Ranunculus aquatilis or white water crowfoot. Uh, typically, I see this species uh, more in southern Wisconsin. It has an alternate leaf arrangement. And um, if you look at the leaves, they're highly uh, dissected and they're pretty delicate. Um, I would say th they, the leaves sort of look like Mirophyllum leaves um, with like diameter. So very delicate leaves. Uh, the leaves are sessile, uh, meaning that there is no petiole, so the leaves attach directly to the stem. Otherwise, um, Ranunculus aquatilis will have a very short petiole. And then if you look at the picture with the penny, um, I think at the, like, the topmost leaf, uh, you can see the leaf sheath uh, quite clearly. So the base of the leaf where it attaches to the stem, it will have a sheath. And then quite commonly in bays, like shallow bays, you'll see this plant flowering. Uh, it has a five petal white flower, which is emergent. The next species is Biden's beckii or water marigold. Uh, typically, I think this is a more northern species. I don't see it too often in southern Wisconsin. Uh, the leaf is whirled or opposite um, and it branches right at the base of the leaf and it is heavily branched and highly dissected. If you're looking at it in the water column, it looks like a bottle brush. It's very poofy and um, fluffy almost. And uh, it is, uh, has yellow emergent flowers that look like aster flowers or daisy flowers. And then it also has some emergent leaves. And instead of being uh, dissected and divided, those are simple leaves with um, serrate leaf margins. And that's all. <laughs> all right, so we are caught up. I forgot that was a fairly short section. So if there are a few questions for Michaela, we can take those now and then we'll move on to some floating plants with Michelle. Yeah, I don't see any uh, con uh, questions on the content that we just heard, but I want to um, kind of quickly review a few from the bladderwort section, if that's all right, Paul. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the first question we had was about fragmentation. Um, Sue notices that motorboat traffic tears up bladderwort, and she's curious whether or not those pieces that result from the mechanical disturbance can survive and grow somewhere else. Gosh, I'm, I'm really not sure, but it does branch fairly often. So I would say, well, let's see, it doesn't have, it doesn't need any roots. So, um, I, but it would, it would have to have some meristematic material. So I guess I would say if it's got a branch and the branch has a little bit of, um, meristem growing tip, then probably it would be okay. Um, but on, I don't know if just uh, a couple, uh, nodes would be enough, would be able to, uh, restart a plant. I'll take anybody else's advice there. Yeah, I think that's that's similar to other species that spread by fragmentation. It does kind of depend on how much of the material is there and, and what you have in your fragment. Um, so maybe not all the time, but um, I agree, Susan, that it's it's probably, it's possible if, if it's co correctly. Different species have, you know, different requirements there. You know, with uh, Eurasian water milfoil, you need a very tiny section to right. produce a brand new plant, um, but other fragments uh, require larger pieces and merit, like you said, marismatic tissue. And then the other question that we had was um, someone lives, uh, again from Sue, lives on a lake uh, where it seems like there's a lot of large purple bladderwort, um, but she has noticed yellow flowers associated with um, areas with, with purple bladderwort. Well, if it really is large purple bladderwort, it ought to have purple flowers. They do have a yellow throat. Um, 
I suppose it's, it's possible that, you know, there's some sort of albinism, you know, that can happen in flowers. I've seen white pickerel weed, for example. So it is possible, but if you, if you find one of those yellow flowers and pull the plant out, it's, it's also possible that you've got common bladder wart mixed in with the large purple. So um, if I would say, I was gonna say this later anyway, um, if anybody has plants that they would like to ha um, have a determination on, they can always mail them to me. And I think of everybody on the line here, I'm the only one who can actually go to my office so you could actually mail them to me. And I'm happy to have you do that. So I would say, go find that yellow flower, pull it out, make sure that it is the purple and it's not the common or one of the other yellow flowered bladder warts. And if you have a question, um, send it off to me. I'd love to see it. Great. Um, and to quickly review, Ceratophyllum echinatum, yes, branches three to four times. Um, not on every leaf though. So again, you, you probably want to look at a number of different leaves to verify whether or not um, it's branching once or twice like demersum or three to four like echinatum. Um, does water marigold, Michaela, have bladders? The photo looked like it had some. Uh, yeah, so water marigold or Biden speciae does not have bl bladders. Um, I think what you're seeing on the pictures is probably like epiphytes or diatoms. Um, so if you were to clean off the leaves, they wouldn't have bladders. Uh, Biden speciae does have a pretty identifiable like uh, plant habit. When it's in the water column, it will look like a, a bottle brush and Biden's beckii is rooted. So typically it'll be vertical in the water column. And like Susan said, the Utrecht vulgaris uh, isn't rooted. So typically it, vulgaris will be laying on the top of the water column, um, like parallel with the water surface. Great. Um, and what about that flower? Uh, Utricularia vulgaris is yellow too. So um, is it, are those easy to tell apart? Yeah, so the flowers are pretty different in my opinion. So the Biden's Beckii has that more like daisy-like flower or the aster flower. And then um, if you look at the Utrecht Eularia flowers, it's gonna look more like that snapdragon flower. Um, my experience, if you look at the bladderwort flower from the side, it looks a lot like the head of Scooby-Doo. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that, Susan. <laughs> I think they look like snapdragons. Uh, okay, two more questions. Um, what about the difference between, if there is any, ranunculus aquatilis and ranunculus longirostris? Yeah, so there used to be thought that the species were different, where longirostris, I think, was more common in southern Wisconsin, but it turns out they're the same species. Um, I think Longstratus typically looked slightly more robust, um, but they are in fact the same species. Great, and um, we've talked about a couple of sheaths and structures attached to leaves and stems on, on the plant. So, um, when we were looking at ranunculus aquatilis versus when we were talking about the pond weeds, um, are the leaves and their sheath the same as a stipule? And if not, what's the difference? Yeah, so the ranunculus, the leaf itself is sheathed around the stem, um, which is different from the stipule. Um, I don't know, maybe. Allie, you might have more to say about that. Yeah, I think it's good to pick up on the fact that that sheath is kind of part of the, the stem and the leaf tissue wrapping around, whereas the stipule is kind of a, a different structure, but um, maybe Paul or Susan? Yeah, and the sheath on a, a plant stem uh, typically envelops all of the leaf tissue. So in the case of the crowfoot, and go back to that one, you can see that basically the entire leaf here ultimately goes through the sheath before it uh, attaches to the stem. So you'd see the same thing on an iris or uh, cattails, things like that, where all the leaves kind of come into one point on the stem and that would be considered a sheath. Whereas a stipule is really just a modified leaf that most of the time isn't even attached uh, to the leaf tissue. Great. 
great. Okay, I believe that catches us up with the questions. Okay, so we'll turn it over to Michelle to cover some floating plants next. All right, um, great. Um, so in this uh, next kind of rotation of plants, we're going to talk about um, kind of two different groups of plants. Um, both of them have leaves um, where the majority of the plant is floating at the water surface. Um, the difference being that the plants um, such as the water smartweed on the left of this slide here are known as floating leaved plants. Um, these are plants that are actually rooted to the bottom of the lake, um, but again most of their, their plant biomass is up at that water surface. And then on the right we have a photo of large duckweed, and this is what is known as a free-floating plant. Um, again, most of the plant biomass is up at the water surface. Um, many of these plants do have roots, but the roots are just sort of dangling free in the water column. And so these free-floating plants aren't actually attached to the bottom of the lake, and they're somewhat at the mercy of wind and, and water currents um, in terms of how they kind of move around. Um, so for example, if a wind's blowing a certain direction, you might have a lot of duckweed in front of a, a, a bay or a property one day, and the next day if the wind switches direction, that might all blow out to other parts of the lake. All right, go ahead. So the first floating leaf plant that we're going to talk about is a plant called spatterdock, also known as bullhead pond lily. Um, and this is Nufar variegata. Um, the spatter dock has these heart-shaped water, water lily leaves um, that again are attached by long stalks to these large spongy underwater rhizomes that creep along the bottom of the lake. Um, if you took one of these long stalks and, and took a knife and just sort of cut a cross section of it, um, you'll notice that it, it has a flattened edge with two ridges and then a circular section. So it looks a lot like the capital letter D, where it's somewhat flattened on one side and then rounded on the others. Um, there's a couple less common Nufar species where this, this cross section of the stalk is actually rounded. Um, so that can be an important characteristic. The flower of the spatter dock is um, a, a cup-like flower, which is bright yellow. And it has these yellow sepals on the outside, as well as a yellow central disc in the middle of that flower. Um, these flowers tend to emerge slightly out of the water column. Um, and um, again, these, these water lilies are oftentimes found growing in conjunction with other species. In general, these, these floating leaved plants are somewhat restricted to grow in the more near shore and shallow areas of lakes. Um, or areas that are uh, more protected from wind and wave action. Um, it, is, it is less likely that you're going to find these, these floating leaf plants out in the middle of the lake or in deeper waters or in areas that exhibit a lot of water flow. All right. And then its counterpart um, that's oftentimes found growing in um, combination with the spatter dock is our white water lily, also sometimes known as the fragrant water lily. Um, the lily pad of white water lily is not heart-shaped, but rather it is circular. Um, although it is not completely circular, um, you'll notice that there's a distinct split or a cut here in one portion of the leaf. Um, somewhat like if you had a pie or a pizza and you took one, one piece or one slice out. Um, these floating leaves can range in size quite uh, considerably. Sometimes they can be just a couple inches across. And we also have some, uh, some super specimens out there that can be a good foot or even two feet across in diameter. The uh, white water lily, as the common name suggests, has a very pretty uh, multi-petaled flower. Um, this typically sits right at the water surface or perhaps just a slight bit above. Um, the, the petals of the water lily are white. And then the center of the water lily is a yellow color. Um, it is important to note that there are some of these non-native ornamental water lilies that are out there um, for sale, especially in the aquarium and water garden industry, which might look superficially similar to the white water lily in that it has these circular lily pads and a multi-petaled flower, 
but oftentimes these are cross hybridized and bred for certain characteristics such as as color um, pink or blue or purple and also oftentimes for things such as disease resistance or or uh, winter hardiness um, so these white water lilies are the only ones that look like this which are native to um, to Wisconsin all right go ahead um, now we're going to talk about a couple of these free-floating plants. Um, the first one here is our small duckweed or lemna minor. Uh, this is a very small plant, um, only a couple millimeters in diameter. Um, you can see on the left here, this is a tip of a mechanical pencil here. Um, and then these are the individual small duckweed plants. Um, it's typically a bright green color. And again, these float freely on the water surface. Um, we oftentimes get calls from um, citizens or other riparians who um, believe they have actually an algal bloom going on when some of these large or small duckweed uh, populations are present. Um, each of the fronds has a single root which dangles into the water column. And these duckweed species are, um, are really experts at absorbing nutrients. Um, they, can, they can take a lot of those nutrients from the water column and they use those nutrients to spread and to um, reproduce. Um, and this is a unique species in that it actually reproduces via budding. So new green fronds will form on this plant. And then after a certain size, a portion of that plant will just break off from the main plant. And then that, that can start a new um, a plant and so on and so forth. Go ahead. And then again, a common associate with the small duckweed is the large duckweed or Spiridella polyrhiza. Uh, polyrhiza is Latin for many roots. And um, one of the main features of the large duckweed is unlike the small duckweed, um, if you flip this, this plant over, you'll notice that it has numerous roots that are coming out of a single frond. Um, it is um, a little bit larger than the uh, small duckweed, um, uh, again, only by a matter of millimeters. And another unique feature of this species is that if you do flip the plant under, uh, over to look for the roots, more often than not, you'll also notice a color difference with the bottom underside of these large duckweeds being a, a dark purple or maroon color versus the top of the plant, which are often this bright green color. And then a final duckweed species um, that we have that's relatively common is our forked duckweed or Lemna trisulca. Again, this is uh, on the small side, um, oftentimes found growing in conjunction with some of those other duckweeds. Um, but unlike some of those other duckweeds, which tend to really float on top of the water surface, um, the forked duckweed tends to somewhat just float freely in the water column. Um, many times when you pull up another plant, such as a pondweed that is rooted to the bottom, you'll find these, these forked duckweeds sort of hooked and uh, tangled masses on these other plants. Um, if you look at this uh, duckweed here, uh, if you have a little bit of an imagination, you can imagine that this is a rowboat here. And so here is the boat itself. And then these are the two oars that are sticking out from the boat. Um, so if you were up in a drone looking down at a rowboat, and so we oftentimes say that this resembles a, a rowboat with oars or sort of a cross or a plus shape look to it. All right, and then moving back to some of these uh, floating leaved plants that are rooted down to the water uh, or to the bottom of the lake. Um, this is water shield, um, which is Brisenia shrubii. Um, again, a common associate with some of those water lilies that I, I talked about in the first few slides. Um, one of the defining features of this plant is that it has a very oval shaped leaf to it or somewhat football shaped, American football. Um, it does not have any um, actual splits or cuts or, or sinuses in it. Although many times this plant will get hammered by a variety of aquatic insects um, and produces lots of holes and lines and it's, it's quite rare to find this plant um, intact, especially later in the season. Um, the uh, leaf stalks are attached to the bottom of these lily pads. And oftentimes along the leaf stalk and as well as the underside of the lily are the water shield pads. There's many times a, a clear 
gelatinous sort of slimy goo that, that coats this plant. Um, you can almost see that a little bit in this picture of the flower here. Um, it's believed that this, this goo might help kind of protect this plant from insect damage and herbivory. Um, it's, it's quite a, a thing to feel if you're out in the field and run your hands along some of this water shield and feel that, that slimy, slick, almost velvety feel to it. Uh, this species does flower, and when it does, there's a small pink-purple flower which is produced that sticks just above the water column. Um, and these flowers are typically produced uh, in about midsummer. Um, this is a zoomed in photo, but they're about the size of a, a nickel. So they're not very large, but they are, um, you know, obvious and can be seen with the naked eye. And then finally, uh, well, we have our water smartweed. Um, this used to be in the uh, polygonum uh, genus, and it's now in the persicaria. Um, it'll probably go back to something else in the near future. Uh, this is a a taxonomically challenging genus. Um, there are numerous terrestrial smartweeds, and this is a species that um, really can, can get its feet wet. Um, oftentimes it's found in shallow waters or along water edges, um, and really it can be highly variable in how it looks, dependent on if it's high and dry or if it's um, maybe growing out to a few feet of water. Um, the leaves are alternately arranged, and unlike a lot of our aquatics that have these very transparent um, leaves, the leaves have a very waxy and sort of smooth appearance. Uh, they look much more like a terrestrial plant. The other identifying characteristic of the species is that it has a uh, very bright pink flower that sticks out of the water column. Um, and again, the species does not tend to grow very deep out in lakes. It can actually even grow up on shore if if need be. And that's the last slide I have, I believe. Great. All right, we have a bunch of questions here. Let's start working through them. Um, Paul, I'm not looking at a copy of the agenda. How are we on time? Uh, we still have three minutes left. Okay, let's see. Let's take a few. Um, all right, first, easy. Are non-native water lilies regulated in Wisconsin? Great question. Um, so the introduction of any non-native plant into a natural water body in Wisconsin is prohibited. Um, no one is allowed to introduce any non-native species intentionally into a natural lake. Um, we have a, an additional list under chapter NR40 of species that are prohibited and restricted which also prevents their sale or introduction or transport in the state. Um, currently, non-native water lilies are not on that prohibited list, um, which means that you are able to sell them. Um, but again, they cannot be introduced into natural water bodies. Um, unfortunately, we do come across people who, who do this. Um, and we, we, we work with the landowners and the Lake Association to first educate them and then also uh, try to remove those plants. Um, oftentimes they are sunk into the lake literally in the pots that they bought them from, um, from the water garden store. So um, sometimes it's an easy removal, but we have seen these um, non-natives spread in, in certain lakes as well. Uh, great, a couple questions on ecological preferences. Will water lilies grow in eutrophic lakes and can they help with water quality? Yes, um, so the, both the white water lily and the spatter dock um, really can grow in a variety of lakes, um, oligotrophic all the way up to eutrophic, um, and they can certainly help with water quality. Um, in general, aquatic plants uh, take in things like phosphorus and nitrogen, and they sequester that in their plant materials. Um, and so they can certainly help, um, you know, take some of those nutrients out of the water column where they might be more prone to um, other algal species or, or cause turbidity or clarity issues. Um, because they're up at the water surface too, they can get a lot of sunlight and carbon dioxide that way, um, where some of the submerged plants maybe could not survive in these more eutrophic lakes. So they're designed to kind of grow through light limited areas in eutrophic systems, yeah. Great. Allie, I'll um, just expand on that yeah. real quick. One other thing that they're really good at doing, any of these floating leaf species are really good at absorbing wave energy. So they reduce the wave erosion uh, impacts on shorelines and that can have a big effect on turbidity and 
nutrient uh, concentrations in the water by reducing erosion along the shoreline. Yes, thank you for that extension, Paul. Um, Okay, so we talked about some of the, the positive benefits, but um, Margaret says rhizomes from the white water lily can become rather large and form a bridge across the lake, which can um, uh, cause problems. It looks like sort of in association with Kara and um, produce some water flow problems. So it really changes the hydrodynamics of a system. Can we manage that? Are there other techniques available other than hacking rhizomes? Sure, I can, I can try to field that one. Um, I, I think what you're seeing is that occasionally these rhizomes um, do manage to lift off of the bottom. Um, a lot of times they creep out of our sight and we don't see them, but um, occasionally gas and other kind of, um, you know, air bubbles kind of fill up under these, these rhizomes and actually lift them up to the water surface. Um, I, I, you know, I know we have folks from all over the, the U.S. on this call today, so I think what I would recommend is, you know, working with someone in your state or your aquatic plant management program to see what is allowed and what isn't allowed. Um, to be honest, hacking the rhizomes is, may potentially contribute to the spread. Um, if you take a rhizome and cut it in two, um, that rhizome will survive. Um, and now you kind of have two plants. So um, folks that propagate water lilies in the ornamental trade actually use this hacking technique to get Kind of stock for their um, their uh, greenhouses and whatnot. Ellie, if you're facilitating, you are muted. Ah, sorry. Um, real quick before we move on, we had a question about pollinators for spatter dock and, and white water lily in particular. Those yeah, are... Um, there are a variety of pollinators that um, that pollinate both spatter dock and white water lilies. Um, I, I'd certainly see a variety of bees. Um, I can think of a certain survey I was on one time where I, the bees were so bad in this area that we were just getting stung left and right because um, we were trying to get through this area where they were uh, they were just massively pollinating all these white water lilies and spatter docks, um, which had just just emerged. Um, I'm sure there's a variety of other other pollinators as well, and I believe there's been some some research specifically looking at at pollinators and and aquatic plant assemblages also. Great, thanks, Michelle. Um, we will return to the question about high water levels later. All right, so let's continue on with the rosettes. Back with Susan again. Okay, so. Um, this is again where I kind of got um, maybe uh, caused some confusion. I'm calling these isoidids in the past um, slides. You've seen them listed as rosettes. Same sort of thing. This is a, um, a, a beautiful photo that Paul took. Um, we were on an expedition to look at plants um, underwater uh, in winter. And so these plants are generally evergreen. They're usually in low nutrient waters or they're in sandy and wave swept areas. Generally, they are not related to each other, all these plants that I'm gonna talk about. And they can create kind of a lawn on the lake bottom and um, are great places for fish to lay eggs and um, uh, great habitat. Um, the important thing about identifying these plants is that what you see above the sediment um, kind of can, they can all kind of look alike or they have many similarities. You really have to uproot the entire plant in order to see what the whole plant looks like. And as we go through these photos, I have uprooted these whole plants. And if you only look at the green portion, you might say, oh, this looks just like the last one. But if you look at the whole plant, usually you can tell them apart. Um, so, and when you do that, you'll see that the leaves and the stems are, um, are green above the sediment and they're white when they're in the sediment. So most of these, when you pull the whole plant up, you can see that part of it is green and part of it is white. This is, these plants are especially common in northern Wisconsin. That's where I am mostly looking for plants. And as far as I know, that's the case. And if um, some of the others that have more experience in the southern part of the state can 
can um, say that whether or not they are common down there, at least uh, they're more common in oligotrophic lakes, and we just seem to have more of them up in the north. Okay, next. Okay, so the first uh, genus I want to talk about are the quillworts, and this is the uh, namesake of this group, the Isoides. And unlike I, I, I've said before, that almost all of our um, flowering, almost all of our aquatic plants are flowering plants. They almost all evolved on land and then secondarily came into fresh water. So, um, and so they are almost all of them are angiosperms and flower. Um, this is one of the exceptions to that. The quillworts are um, spore producing, and so in that way, they are more like a fern. So um, the leaves themselves are stiff and kind of like porcupine quills. It's probably where the, the term came from. And as you can see, um, part of the plant is green, and that part would have been out of the sediment and photosynthesizing, and the lower portion is white. So all of that would have been under the sediment. Um, and at the base, um, maybe Paul, if you've got your pointer, you could point to that little, down at the base, it's kind of, in, uh, it's kind of flared, almost like um, a little, uh, like celery, um, where, you know, if you've got a stalk of celery and it's kind of flared at the base. And then imagine that there's a little sack of, almost like a little tea bag stuck right inside that flared section of that celery-like base. And there's a little sack of seed of spores down there. The spores are very tiny and they're grit-like, kind of like um, if you felt them with your fingers, feels almost like um, cornmeal. But um, we do have two common species. Um, they're a little hard to tell apart, but the spores themselves, which are quite tiny, um, you really need kind of a microscope to see, but these are pictures by Michaela up here in the top. Uh, on the left, we have Isodes lacustris, and those spores are a little bigger. They're more like 600 microns, and they have these elaborate little decorations all over them. The one on the right is Isodes echinospora, and echinospora, echino means spine, and so it's got these little spines sticking out all over it, and these spores are smaller, less than 500 microns. Um, the leaves in cross-section have four chambers, um, and so um, they're very common in uh, sandy, especially rocky areas. Um, when you're doing a plant survey, if it's rocky, you might pull up one or two leaves, but you might not pull up the whole plant because they're kind of down and in between the rocks. So uh, you got to look for that flared um, leaf. And they don't always have those spores. Um, it takes a while into the summer, kind of like flowers, um, before those spores will be developed. Okay, next. The next one is pipewort. Um, these plants grow in little tufts. You can see that in, I've got it in a little petri dish to give you a sense of scale. Um, and the leaves are like long, very, very skinny triangles with a very, very fine point. The roots are cross-hatched, look kind of like worms, um, uh, and it flowers very commonly. And you can see that um, some of those have flowers there. They must have been underwater, but one of them that is going out the furthest is, um, has a little white button at the tip. And um, that's uh, the flower, and it's very distinctive. And this plant is usually growing pretty close to shore in pretty shallow water and you will often see it flowering, especially um, by midsummer. Okay, next. Uh, the next one is um, elatine or elatine, not sure how to pronounce that Latin name, minima, uh, waterwort. This is a really tiny plant. You can see the penny. They're about just two to four centimeters tall, and they have paired rounded leaves in very shallow water, um, commonly in sand. Okay, next. Water lobelia is one of the cuter little rosette plants, I think. It's got these uh, basal cluster of leaves and the leaves arch away from each other so that there's a little, like a little bouquet of them down there on the bottom of the lake. Um, each leaf is actually two tubes fused together. So if you use your thumbnail and you just snip off one of those leaves, you can see that there are two tubes um, fused right next to each other, kind of like a double-barreled shotgun. And uh, these guys are quite leathery almost. And this plant will has extensive roots and it will take up 
pretty much all of its carbon, not to mention its roots, I mean its nutrients uh, from the roots. So that's unusual in that this plant um, takes up its um, carbon from the roots. Okay, next. Um, dwarf water milfoil. Believe it or not, this is a water milfoil, Myriophyllum tenellum. Remember that these plants are categorized um, taxonomically by their flowers. So it doesn't have that typical feather-like leaf, typical of other milfoils, um, but rather it looks, um, stems come right out of this rhizome. And again, you can see where it's white, it was underground. Where it's green, it's sticking up. And um, the, the stems pop up at regular intervals, every couple of centimeters or so. And so you can kind of get a hold of one and pull it and you'll get this whole long line like little soldiers marching along. The stems themselves don't really have much of any leaves, but they do have scales. So it looks very much like asparagus, um, you know, that you eat um, with those little tiny scales. It's just on a diminutive level. And you can see a turf of this. So you can see um, pretty big expanses of that, this, and, um, and uh, it'll grow with these other isoidids, but you can have this as kind of a monoculture in some places. Okay, next. Uh, Brown-fruited rush is Juncus palocarpus. Um, this entire plant is quite flattened. It's like you took um, a celery plant with leaves kind of cupped around each other and you just took a big rolling pin and you just flattened the whole thing. The whole thing is very much flattened. Again, you can see where it's green uh, was above um, the water surface and where it's white, uh, it was below, uh, not the water surface, I'm sorry, the sediment surface. And where it's white, it was below the sediment. And so again, it would look a lot like some of these other plants unless you pulled the whole plant out and you can see that the, um, uh, that the plant is very much flattened. It also has pretty extensive roots. And this plant, uh, the leaves are folded around each other. Um, so uh, they're very much cupped around each other um, and sort of sheathing each other. And this can also form uh, a turf along with um, some of the other isolates. Okay, next. Um, needle spike rush, um, if you just look at the above sediment section, it will also look very much like the brown fruited rush. But you pull the whole thing up and you can see that each one of these stems is like a needle going down to the sediment. Each one goes down by itself. There, it may, there may be tufts of it, there may be little clusters of it, but each one goes down to the base singly like a whole bunch of needles attaching to the rhizome. And again, you've got the green portion um, above the sediment, the white portion below the sediment, and um, otherwise uh, this needle spike rush and brown fruited rush can look quite a bit alike until you pull the whole plant up and then it's a, a little bit more obvious. This can also form a turf or along with all the others, um, you'll get a, a mixed species turf, okay? Gradiola um, aurea or golden pert is a sturdy little plant. I think of it as like a, sort of a fire hydrant plant. It almost looks like that, you know, where you've got the little fire hydrant with its little arms sticking out to the side. It's a, it's a thick, sturdy um, plant with these opposite little uh, pointed leaves. So in some ways it kind of looks like a Latin, which I showed earlier, but that is, those plants are very tiny. They're only a few centimeters. This one can get quite big. It can be maybe 10, 12 centimeters tall. Um, and the leaves are pointed and they go, um, they, they shift 90 degrees around the plant. So they're going left and right and then into the picture and out of the picture and then left and right, etc. So they're, they're sort of um, twisting as they go up the stem. This is one of those plants along with um, the brown fruited rush, which can be stranded on shore. And if it is, it looks quite different. So um, uh, it will have a yellow flower, um, and it is actually a snapdragon in the snapdragon family. So, okay, next. Um, this we have seen before in the bladderwort section, so I've included it here because it is like these other isoidids in that it's got these green grass-like leaves sticking up into the water, and then the and then the white portion, which includes the bladders, is stuck down in the sediment. And so um, I have also, although this plant is not super common, there are lake, little lakes up here, little low nutrient lakes, 
where I have seen this form a turf over the, most of the bottom of the lake. Um, generally, if you see that, you're not going to see it flower, but it, it can, um, that's another reason to pull up these plants right from the bottom, because if you see um, little bladders, um, you will say, oh, well, this isn't um, needle spike rush, this is um, small purple bladderwort, because needle spike rush, although the leaves look pretty similar, it will never, needle spike rush will not have any bladders. Okay, next. I think that's it. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to uh, put them into the chat. Um, but for the time being, let's return back to that interesting ecological question that was posed earlier. Um, lakes across Wisconsin, you know, depending on the area you in, some of them are experiencing very high water levels associated with maybe increasing precipitation events. And the question was, how do water level changes, and in particular these high water levels, affect the distribution of aquatic plants within lakes. Who's gonna take that? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, as these, a lot of these plants have depth preferences. They usually can grow in a range of depths, um, but that allows them to adapt to changes in water level as well. So think about a water lily patch that might go from a foot deep to five and a half feet deep. And if the water level changes by a foot or two over the course of a year or several years, then that whole population can kind of shift its way up the shore or into deeper water, depending on which way the water went. So we are seeing shifts in the aquatic plant communities based on these high water levels. Uh, typically the same species will be present year to year but they will take on different forms and may move up and down the shoreline a little bit uh, as that water level changes. And there are certain species that are really well adapted to that, like the water smartweed that uh, Michelle mentioned. It can tolerate being way up on the shoreline with no water, or it can be in several feet of water. So it can move whichever way it needs to. Things like the gradiola and the uh, brown fruited rush and things that Susan just talked about are the same way. They can be completely stranded on land and do just fine. They can also be in many feet of water in a, a different form. So they're pretty resilient and they tend to just adapt when the water level changes. Great, thanks Paul. Doesn't look like we have anything in the queue anymore. All right, so let's move right on, on to Michaela's section on other common plants. Okay, so uh, the first species is Elodea canadensis or common water weed. Um, this species is a cosmopolitan species. Um, it's found in a lot of different lakes. Typically, I don't see it in oligotrophic lakes or super clear um, lakes. It is a world plant. It has world leaves of three. Um, so if you look at the plant picture on the left, um, you have the whirl right there, a cross section. And then I also have drawn a picture. Um, sometimes the leaves will be more um, globose or rounded, and sometimes they're going to be a little narrower and longer. So these leaves are entire, entirely sessile, um, so there is no pedi petiole at all, and also the leaf margin is entire, meaning there's no teeth, it's smooth. Um, the leaves are typically around 1.75 to 4 millimeters wide and two to five times as long. We have another species in Wisconsin, Elodea natalii, and those leaves are going to be about five to ten times as long as they are wide. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if you see something that looks like Elodea canadensis but has really narrow and long leaves, it might be a different species. Um, and then oftentimes you'll see adventitious roots coming out from the leaf nodes. Next. Um, so now we have Valicinaria americana or water celery. This is a basal rosette. 
uh, all the leaves come out from the base of the plant and they spread on rhizomes. Uh, typically, the leaves are relatively narrow, um, I think about up to a centimeter wide and relatively long. Uh, typically, the leaves are going to have an entire smooth leaf margin, although they can be finely toothed. Um, if you want to see the teeth, you would need either a microscope or a hand lens. And then along the mid vein, there are several rows of lacunar uh, cells or lacunar bands. And uh, if you break a leaf in half, uh, you'll see stringy, stringy mucus. Uh, I don't have a picture of it in this slide, but I think Paul has a nice picture of it in his book. And uh, this plant is a wind pollinator. So it has long flower stalks um, that will go to the surface of the water. And once the uh, fruit is uh, pollinated, uh, that stalk will coil down and pull that fruit back underwater. Um, and Paul, if you want to trace the flower stalk on that left picture. Yep. And then the fruit kind of looks like a green bean, like an ordinary green bean. Um, yeah, next. So the next species is Sagittarius spa, the basal rosette formation. So sometimes uh, Sagittaria will not uh, have those emergent leaves with the flowers. They'll stay um, submerged and they are pretty nondescript. So again, basal rosette, they spread via rhizome and Typically, depending on the species, typically the leaves will not be completely flat uh, like Valicinaria. They might be slightly convex, um, but again, this is dependent on the species. Um, they have an extremely acute leaf tip compared to Valicinaria. Valicinaria has more of like a blunted to acute leaf tip, um, where Sag Sagittaria is pretty acute. And then the roots um, on Sagittaria are segmented, similar to Iriacolum aquaticum. So if you're not sure if it's a young Valicinaria or Sagittaria, a quick thing you can look is at the roots. And also Sagittaria has uh, large shells that look like bricks. And in the next uh, slide, uh, we have a drawing from Crow and Hellquest, uh, which you can see the cell structure. So the second uh, image is of Valicinaria. Uh, near that midrib, you can see those lacunar cells, those large empty cells. And then Sagittaria, or the third image to the left, uh, has those large shells at, that are more brick-like. Next. All right, so the next um, group of plants I'm going to be talking about are the naiads or naias species. Uh, these species are always going to be opposite and the leaves will always be toothed. Uh, so the most common naias we have in Wisconsin is naias flexilis. Uh, this is more of a cosmopolitan species again. Um, it doesn't have uh, so much of the lake preference compared to some of the other Naya species we have. So if you were to uh, carefully peel off a leaf from the plant um, and get the leaf base, if you count the number of teeth per side, it's gonna have around 20 to 60 teeth per side. Um, the leaves are going to be around 0.2 to 0.6 millimeters wide. Typically, I see the leaves are going to be more around like 0.4 millimeters. Um, and then typically, if you look at the leaf base, it's going to be slightly sloped. I like to say that Naya species have shoulders on the leaves. Um, so uh, Naya flexilis is slightly sloped. It sort of looks like a half a lips. And then this species can be heavily branched. Um, or sparse in appearance. So the picture with the penny, uh, you can see that near the apex of the plant that there is really short internal distance, um, heavily branched, and it looks very bushy. Uh, 
And then on the picture on the left, you can see that this species or this individual is more sparse looking. And this Nias flexilis will have an acute leaf tip. Next. Uh, the next uh, species we have is Nias guadalupensis or Southern Nyad. Um, again, another common species that you'll see. This one is very similar to Nias flexilis. Again, opposite in toothed leaves, uh, 20 to 60 teeth per leaf side again, and that leaf base is also going to have that uh, slightly sloped shape. Uh, key differences between guad and uh, flexilis is the leaf tip. On guadalupensis, the leaf tip is going to be more blunted uh, versus uh, flex is going to be more acute. And then again, this can have a more... Um, bushy or sparse appearance. Typically, guadalupensis is going to be uh, less um, branched than Nias flexilis. And again, these leaves are going to be wider than Nias flexilis. There is a bit of overlap, but typically you'll see these leaves more on the uh, two millimeter uh, width range. Uh, next. So here's just a comparison between Nias guadalupensis and Nias flexilis. In each picture, guadalupensis is on the left and uh, flexilis is on the right. So as you can see in these pictures, guad is much more stout. Um, and then Nias flexilis is more bushy and it looks maybe more whimsical than the guad. Next. So another species we have is Nias grassalima or northern naiad. This species typically I don't see in southern Wisconsin. It's more of a northern species. Uh, again, opposite in toothed. This one, if you're counting the teeth per leaf side, is only going to have 6 to 20 teeth per side. Uh, so there is a little overlap between flexilis and grassalima, but again, grassalima is going to have far fewer sides. And then if you're looking at the leaf base, um, on Grassalima compared to Flexilis, it's going to have more of like a truncated or isosceles trapezoid shoulder shape. Um, so it's going to be much more squared off compared to uh, Guad and Flexilis. And then again, this species is heavily branched, a uh, similar appearance to Nias Flexilis, um, very bushy. And then the leaf tip is extremely acute. Um, so very pointed. And then the leaves are going to be much narrower. So this is typically less than 0.3 millimeters wide. Um, sometimes the species can be confused with um, like a fine leaf uh, pondweed or maybe even like a nitella species just because those leaves are so narrow. Um, but again, uh, remember Nias will have that opposite leaf arrangement. And then another species we have is Nias marina. Uh, this is a, I believe, restricted species in Wisconsin. Um, again, it's going to have opposite leaf arrangement and teeth leaved. Um, and then another key characteristic is that there is going to be spines on the stem of the plant, and there's going to be spines on the underside of the mid vein. So if you look at the picture, you can tell it's um, extremely spiny and toothed and the teeth are clearly visible with the naked eye. I guess I should mention with the other Nia species, um, you will need a hand lens or a microscope to see those teeth. Those teeth are not visible um, with your naked eye. Next. And now we have Nias minor or brittle naiad. Um, this is a prohibited species in Wisconsin. The leaves are opposite and toothed leaf margin. Um, typically, this plant is going to be relatively bushy and the leaves are going to be recurved. Um, so those leaves are going to curl back onto the stem, basically. And then this is going to have a similar uh, like teeth overlap with the grassalima 6 to 20 um, per leaf side and then typically 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters wide and more of a heart-shaped uh, leaf base and uh, typically 
minor in Marina or more, I don't think there's any reports of minor in northern Wisconsin, but typically you'll see Marina uh, in southern Wisconsin. And these are the photo credits. And that's it. Great. Thank you, Michaela. Wild celery is a cool plant, Tracy. Um, has some really neat uh, ways that they um, sexually reproduce and pollinate in the timing. And some cool work has been done on that species. Um, let's see. I don't believe we have any other questions yet on this section. If anybody has any questions for Michaela, go ahead and type them in the chat. But it looks like we might be good to go, Paul. Okay. So this is our final section here. I'll take about 15 minutes to talk about these macro algae that we see in Midwestern lakes. And then we'll have some time for final Q&A at the end. So we can take any questions that are remaining about any section that we've covered so far. So these algae here are uh, often confused with vascular plants in that they do have what looks like a stem and leaves, but they truly are just very complex groups of algae. So this family we call the Caraceae family. It's, it includes five genera or five groups of species, Cara, Nitella, Talipella, Lycnothamnus and Nidolopsis. So there's many different uh, genera there and also many species in our region. This picture here is from Vermont, uh, from Lake Mempromagog, which was Vermont's first starry stonewort uh, infested lake, or I shouldn't say infested, but the first one that had starry stonewort. Um, and what you see is three different genera right next to each other. And uh, of course, I had to take a picture of this when I saw it. It was so convenient to have three different genera next to each other. Um, and what you see on the left is Talipella, which is the, uh, the rarest of the, the genera, I think, uh, in general. It is a uh, fairly unusual looking species and then it has these very dense heads that form when the branchlets divide over and over and over. Uh, and they form these, these dense heads on the plants. They typically grow in single individuals instead of colonies. And they're usually deep, so it was unusual to find the Talipella in this area, which was probably about four feet deep. Um, most of the time they're 15, 20, 30 feet deep, so um, it was interesting to see them in shallow water. And on the photo here you see in the middle is Cara. That is a Cara contraria, which is our most common Cara species, the common musk grass. And that one is growing as a, a small clump or a single indiv individual there um, with small branchlets that do not fork at all. So it has a whirl of six or eight or so branchlets coming off and then the stem continues up and there's another whirl of short branchlets. And on the right, you see Nidolopsis, which is the starry stonewort. That is our only non-native species uh, in, in the Midwest here. Um, Nidolopsis obtusa, the starry stonewort. You see a little bit of that behind the cara as well. You can see that with the long bract cell uh, making it look like the branchlet is actually forking. So it is possible to see many different species right next to each other. The family as a whole, the Caraceae family, includes a lot of species that form these little short carpets on the lake bottom and they're very effective at holding invertebrates. So you can see the perch here going uh, almost vertically, picking invertebrates out of the cara mat. I was snorkeling when I took that picture and was just watching this perch just go up and down and almost just float straight up and then move over. And I pictured some kind of a lab instrument filling test tubes and then lifting off and moving over and filling more. Um, just moving basically vertically up and down and picking these different invertebrates out of the cara. These species are also very effective at competing with other kinds of algae because they do absorb nutrients directly through the entire plant tissue, not through roots. They are not rooted plants. They absorb everything they need 
right through the entire surface area of the plant. So if this is two or three or four feet tall, it is absorbing nutrients from the water column, dissolved phosphorus and other dissolved nutrients right through that entire plant. And they're very effective at removing those nutrients and making them unavailable to things like planktonic algae or filamentous algae, blue-green algae, other things that are less desirable. They're sought out by waterfowl for their value in as far as food. They hold a lot of invertebrates. They also pack a lot of energy into their reproductive structures. So ducks will often seek those out and consume all the, the tops of the plants where the reproductive structures are usually concentrated. Um, and I mentioned the invertebrate habitat already. So one of the important features in this family is the cortication on the stem. And that's these little stripes that run up and down the stem. The, uh, it's the cortex of the plant, which is that outer layer around the, the main stem there, can be divided into many of these, these uh, long vertical cells, or in a few cases, it doesn't have any cortication. It's just a smooth green stem all the way around, and, and there is no cortex at all around the outside. The photo that you see here on the right, you can see those, those long cells going up and down the stem. And on the left is an illustration that Michaela did, talking about uh, different forms of the little spiny cells that can be on the, the cortex cells. So you can see in the illustration, there's a little stripe running up and down, and uh, you get these different little spine structures that form on those cells as well, which I'll talk about next. So here's just a close up looking at that cortication again. And one of the important things we see here is that the spine cells, which I'll point to here, this one here, and then this one over here, this one over here, they skip a row of corticating cells each time. So we have a spine cell on every other one. And this is what we would call two corticate, meaning that there are two lines for every spine cell. We call this a primary corticating cell, and then there'd be a secondary one, which does not have any spine cells on it, and then another primary, a secondary, a primary, and so we have two corticating cells per spine cell, or that's also per branchlet uh, on the plant. And the branchlets are, it's just another word for the leaf, really, that's what you would look at a, a Cara or some other species within this, in this, within this group and call a leaf. But since it's an algae, it has a different terminology and it's, it's really called a branchlet. But whatever term you want to use is fine. It refers to the same thing. So uh, talking about spine cells a little bit further, they can be a variety of different shapes. In this case, they're very circular and flattened, but they can be very spiny. There can be one or two or three occurring as a group at a certain point. Um, most of the time they're individual spine cells and they can be flat or they can be kind of sharp depending on the species. So here's an example of a Cara haitensis um, that has very sharp spine cells coming out and you can also see those corticating cells are much more finely packed because there are more of them on this species. And the branchlet division or lack of branchlet division is important in that Cara and um, several other the genera in this group do not have any division of their branchlets. So again, the branchlet is referring to this leaf-like structure here. And if you take one of these and follow it from the stem out, it does not divide at all. It just keeps going straight and then it ends. And you can see the difference between that and the lower photo, which is a Nitella uh, mucronata, the mucronate Nitella species, which has a branchlet coming out from the stem. And then at the end, it splits into three fingers or three dactyls, they're called. Um, so it always divides into at least two fingers at the end on all Nitella species. And then the stipulodes are these special structures that are underneath a whorl of leaves or a whorl of branchlets. So you have this ring or sometimes two rings of these cells that usually point down or they point, point out to the side. Um, and so on the, the upper photo, this is a Cara the bronze stonewort. 
which is one that does not have any of those corticating cells. So you can see the stem and the branchlets and everything here are just smooth and green. They don't have those stripes on them anywhere. So this is an example of a cara that does not have those cells. Uh, most of them do, um, but this is one of just a couple that does not. And the stipulodes are these short structures that are pointing out to the side. So there's one ring of stipulodes on this species. The one on the bottom has two rows. Uh, you can clearly see the upper row, which points up toward the branchlets here. And then right here is another row that's pointing downward along the stem. So this does require at least a 10x hand lens to see. Um, this photo was taken with a macro lens that magnifies it at almost 10x. So this is about what you would see through a 10x hand lens. And then the placement of the reproductive structures is really important. The female reproductive structure on, uh, on a cara or anything in this family is called the oogonium. And the antheridium is the male structure. Oogonia is a plural form of oogonium. Antheridia is the plural form of antheridium. And whether these things are touching each other or separated is important. So in this case, we have a, an egg-shaped oogonia, uh, oogonium here, the female, and the male antheridium here, which is more spherical, and those are touching. So that's what we call conjoined um, between those two structures. They are conjoined, they are touching each other. And C-joined means that they are not touching. They are separated from each other on the same plant, but at different locations. So here we have a female, here we have a male, a male, female, and a male, all at different locations on that one branchlet. And dioecious means that there are two separate plants. So there's a male plant and there's a female plant. Monoecious means that the males and females are on the same plant as in both of these examples here. So you can see how this group is a little bit tricky compared to some of the things we've talked about before. We left this one for the end on purpose. Um, it is one that not everybody is willing to examine the, the, these features and try to distinguish these species apart from each other. Um, but it is a very diverse group. We have over two dozen species um, in Wisconsin that we've confirmed. And we're learning a lot about them and their habitat preferences and what they can tell us about a water body. And so we're starting to realize how important they are and more people are trying to get these down to species level. So let's talk about Cara in general first. This group includes about 10 species here in Wisconsin, at least. There may be more that we haven't found yet. They have branchlets, and again, that just refers to those leaves that are around the stem. The branchlets are not forked or divided at all. They are straight, and then they just come to an end. Most of those species have the corticating cells along the stem, and they tend to be more common in hard water, although we do have some species in the Midwest here that are very, very much prefer soft water habitats. They like to be in peat, they like to grow in bogs and other more acidic uh, nutrient poor environments. So it is certainly not exclusively a hard water group. And here's some examples of different species. We have that Carabronii here on the left, the bronze stonewort, which is uh, we call it e-corticate, meaning that it does not have any corticating cells on the stem here. They are completely smooth and bright green with no striping at all. Then we have uh, Carafoliolosa, the leafy stonewort on the lower left. That's a common species of softwater habitats. Cara aspera here on the upper right is a very tiny one. It often grows to just a few inches tall and forms little carpets in very shallow water on sand especially. And then on the lower right is one that is a really interesting one because it's endemic to the Midwest and it is our only emergent Cara species as well. Um, it was known from just a few locations in Minnesota, or not, not Minnesota, Michigan and Northern Indiana. And we recently found it in Wisconsin and we have five populations now documented in Wisconsin, all in fens that have open marl flats. And there's only one or two other populations in the world that had this species remaining. And those are, I believe both of them are in Northern Indiana. 
Um, so it's a really very much isolated species to right here in the Midwest with very few populations remaining. And that's the Britain's stonewort, Cara bretonii. Okay, and then we have Nitella, which is another group within this family that does have branchlets that are forked at the end. And you can see that in the underwater photo on the left. Uh, you can sort of see it on the right photo, although they're so densely branched that it's hard to pick out any individual branchlet there. And these do not have any cortication. They are completely smooth and green on all species within the Nitella group. And they are more common in soft water, but again, can be in hard water depending on the species. There are some that only grow in soft water. There are some that, that seem to prefer the hard water environments. The one on the uh, top of your slide there on the upper left is the small Nitella, Nitella tenuissima, which only grows to about the size you see in that photograph. So a couple inches tall is pretty big for that one. And it just looks like these little dark green balls on a fine string. That's usually in very shallow water, maybe a foot deep or so. Um, but other Nitella species can be 50 plus feet deep. Uh, they can tolerate very high water pressure and very little light. All right, here's a couple other species. We have the um, Nitella gracilis here, in the, or microcarpa in the, low, the upper left which is a soft water specialist. It likes to be in shallow sand, maybe four to six feet deep. Um, Nitella mucronata here in the lower left, which is typically in impoundments, a little bit more nutrient rich and softer, um, um, sorry, nutrient rich and um, softer sediments. And in the upper right is our typical Nitella flexilis, the slender stonewort or common, uh, common Nitella, very much a common species throughout the state. And the one in the lower right is Nitella clavata, um, which is a really interesting one that typically grows in very large water bodies. So that one was pulled out of Schwamigan Bay, which is part of Lake Superior. Um, other very large lakes, you can occasionally find the clavata growing in. All right, and then I'll just touch on this one here. Starry stonewort is one that is not native. It is our only non-native species within this family. And it showed up here in the fall of 2014 in Southeast Wisconsin. It's been in Michigan for much longer. It came into Minnesota in 2015, or at least uh, was documented in Minnesota in 2015. Um, my suspicion is that in Minnesota and Wisconsin, it was here for a few years at least before we found it, um, but that's when we actually documented it for the first time in 2014. It is a species that is also not corticated, so there are no corticating cells or stripes along the stem, and the branchlets actually do not fork, even though a few of these branchlets here look like they are, which makes it a tricky species to identify sometimes. So what you're actually seeing is a bract cell, uh, which is if they form where the reproductive structures form on the plant. And it's not actually the branchlet forking, it's just this extra cell, kind of like the bract leaves that we looked at on the milfoils a little while ago. What you will notice right away with this species is that it's very large. You can see compared to the nickel, it's, it's enormous. Um, they can be four to six inches in diameter which is much larger than really any of the other species in this family that you'd see in the Midwest. And um, it has a very stiff appearance out of water too. So if you take it out, it tends to collapse, or sorry, it tends to not collapse out of the water. It's a very stiff plant out of water compared to a Nitella or really anything else in this group that looks like this, it would, it would just collapse over your finger. It would not have really any structure out of the water. The other thing to look for is these ball bills that are underwater. A ball bill is kind of like a turion in that it's a starch reserve for the plant that is located at underground or uh, at the surface. And it looks like a little star in this case. That's where the name comes from for starry stonewort. You can see in the right photo that one starry stonewort plant can produce many of these little white ball bills just under the surface of the sediment and each ball bill can produce multiple new starry stonewort plants as well. So looking for 
the very large form, the stiff uh, appearance out of water, and the little star-shaped ball bills would all be very good ways to tell this apart from others. Then the other two genera that are present here in the Midwest are Talipella, um, the bird's nest stonewort, nice name because it looks much like an eagle's nest or something with a bunch of tangled sticks, and Lycnothamnus, the bearded stonewort. Um, Lycnothamnus is present in Wisconsin and Minnesota in about 15 lakes. Those are the only locations known in North America. Um, it was previously only known to be a very rare species in parts of Europe and Asia until 2012 when we found uh, one of these populations here in central Wisconsin and have since documented quite a few other ones. So again, we have about 15, 15 populations here between Wisconsin and the Twin Cities area of Minnesota. And that one grows in shallow water or deep water. It can be up to about eight feet long, so it's a very large plant. Um, Talipella tends to be just about a, a foot or so in length, maybe a little bit longer has these very large dense heads that tend to cause the plant to fall over under the weight of the heads or the heads themselves will break off and occasionally on a rake if you're uh, doing a plant survey with a large rake you may pull up just the head of a talipella not actually the entire plant because the head will catch the rake and break off. So with that um, we are ready for questions. Uh, I'll just move through a la the last couple of closing slides here uh, and then we'll do some final Q&A. So this was a lot to take in. We understand that. We actually toned it down a little bit for this compared to our in-person training where we'd have live plants available for you to look at, but we did discuss less than a third of the aquatic plants that we have here in Wisconsin. Um, so there's a lot more to talk about. And remember that we did record this webinar, so you can watch it again. You can share it with others if you like. So just watch for an email from me. I'll send a link right to this recording. It'll be on the UW Extension Lakes YouTube channel. And again, I'll have that within, within a few days here. Um, so we can take the final questions here. And here's our contact information for the four of us in case you'd like to send us an unknown aquatic plant photo or, or other questions that we may not get to today. Great. Thanks, Paul. We do have a couple of questions. First, I thought um, Michelle might be able to um, look at, let's see, the question that we have about caramats. So um, Margaret reports that caramats have been a major problem on Jesse Lake in Langlade County. Jesse Lake is eutrophic, and she's wondering if there are management options um, because she perceives it to be suffocating the waters. Uh, in addition, Kara decays at the end of the season and appears to accumulate on the bottom, creating muck. Um, there might be, you know, some water circulation effects, and she's just kind of looking for some tips on, on that um, and, and also management. So, Michelle, do you want to sure. give some thoughts there? Yeah, so, so our native Kara species can certainly... Um, you know, grow in abundance, especially in shallower waters of lakes. Um, you know, they, they do um, really help, especially in eutrophic systems, because they help kind of stabilize those bottom sediments, um, you know, preventing those nutrients from getting back up into the water column and, you know, perhaps even causing more excessive plant growth. Um, you know, in general, we, you know, we kind of discourage the management of native plants because their benefits, um, you know, are, are, are many, and I think that's definitely been um, hopefully emphasized here in the webinar today. Um, but there are options, especially when they are, you know, inhibiting areas of, of like accessing the lake. Um, and so I would recommend that first off, you get an aquatic plant survey done on the lake. Um, and I actually quickly looked up and, and noticed in 2019, there was actually a plant survey on Jesse Lake. So that's, that's you know, you have some great information there. And then using that information and talking with your regional lake biologists and the rest of the members that live on your lake, um, you know, you could, you could discuss what your management options might be and, and where the real areas of concern are. 
um, you know, every lake is very unique and different. So um, I think that management plan is critical, um, not only to understanding what's out there, but you know, what the real goals and objectives of management might be. Um, so. Thanks, Michelle. Any other comments on that interesting question? Well, I'll speak to the muck issue a little bit. I think most of what you're seeing under Karamats is the marl accumulation, M-A-R-L. And marl is, uh, it's a, a bunch of minerals that fall out of the water solution naturally, uh, just because the groundwater is so saturated with minerals. And that's a common place for Kara to grow, certainly a, a few species of Kara in particular. So it's not really the Kara itself that is uh, accumulating as muck. It is the marl that is just uh, precipitating out of the water and building up on the bottom of the lake. Uh, it may be mixing with some decaying Kara as well, but the, the Kara isn't really the root of the, the problem there as far as the accumulation of materials. Yeah, and there's um, an idea of suffocating waters um, there as well. It is important to note that uh, large die-offs in aquatic plant um, communities can be associated with dissolved oxygen crashes as decomposition progresses. In general, um, you know, especially during the day, aquatic plants um, tend to add oxygen to the environment, um, but there are, you know, important oxygen dynamics to consider, um, especially when we're thinking about large-scale management uh, strategies. Okay, let's see. Um, somebody is asking for a clarification here. The differences between Rosette Sagittaria and a just starting to grow basil pickerel weed. I believe, uh, um, Susan, you kind of touched on rosettes and- Yep. yep. Um, that is pretty tricky. Um, I would say the Pickerel weed, I don't see as a rosette as often as Sagittaria, so there's that. But it does look pretty similar. There's actually a pretty nice uh, diagram in Crow and Helquist, I think only, of the venation, which is quite different. Um, so maybe I'll try and get a picture of that and, and have Paul send that out. Um, so they do look, if you look at them with a hand lens, they do look um, pretty different. Um, I don't think I can describe it, but um, if you see a, a photo of the two next to each other, they might be a little easier to tell apart. Paul, you have any input there? Yeah, the pickerel weed rosettes, uh, they aren't a rosette for too long. The, the new seedlings, if they're produced underwater, will form a little rosette type appearance to them. Um, usually those seedlings still have the seed attached, so you'll have a very large uh, egg-shaped bumpy seed still attached to it. So that would distinguish from a, a, the very thin papery circular seed of an arrowhead. Um, the rosettes of pickerel weed would not have segmented roots either like the Sagittaria would. And Pontedaria or the pickerel weed is, a, is an alternate leaved species. So those rosettes very quickly start to form alternate leaves. And you'd be able to see that too if you looked really closely, whereas an arrowhead um, has all of its leaves coming together at the base. Great, thanks, Paul. Um, another question for you about Nidolopsis obtusa. At a first glance, it looks very similar to a thin leaf pondweed. Um, what characteristics might you suggest first to check to differentiate the two? Yeah, one, one easy thing is that all pondweeds have alternate leaves. So um, all of the caraceae, those macroalgae, have world leaves of typically six or sometimes more. So they're occurring in a ring of leaves around the stem and all pondweeds are gonna have one leaf on the left, one on the right, one on the left. It's gonna alternate sides of the stem. So that would be the easiest thing to look for. Um, certainly you could also try to uproot any of the ball bills that would be there on the starry stonewort if you suspected it was starry stonewort. Those ball bills are produced uh, and, um, and remain under the plant for pretty much the entire growing season. So you're likely to find them if you see starry stonewort and it is in fact starry stonewort, you'll find those ball bills present underneath the plant as well. 
Great, thanks. Um, Robert asks, what the, is the latest status on Japanese hedge parsley invasive, especially in the larger South Central Wisconsin waterways? Um, I'll just plug quickly the invasive species uh, site. If you go on the DNR site and, and search for invasives, you can find some information on a Japanese hedge parsley, some links to the UW herbarium resources, control information. But does anyone have anything to add? No, I was going to point to the DNR website as well, or the Wisconsin First Detector Network, um, or you can search for the uh, Renz lab at UW-Madison, that's R-E-N-Z. Uh, Mark Renz and his students do a lot of work on terrestrial invasive plants. Japanese hedge parsley is, is not an aquatic, so it's not something we were planning on addressing today. It's more of a roadside and kind of forest edge uh, field species. So, um, yeah, I would check any of those resources for more information. Yeah, it looks like uh, Matt Walrath, one of our outreach partners, has uh, directed you to the Whistlora link as well. Um, okay, some uh, one question about long-term population dynamics. Lynn asks, um, in particular, about Vallisneria. It seems to have increased over time in the Madison Lakes. that could go to anyone almost. Yeah, I guess my take on that is that, uh, as I kind of mentioned before, as things change in the lake, whether it's water levels or nutrient um, availability or light penetration levels or any of that, th any of those things, um, the different aquatic plants that occur within the community can shift quite a bit from year to year. We don't really fully understand what causes particular shifts in the community, what would make one species become more abundant or less abundant over the course of a few years. Um, it certainly happens, but it's it's in response to a, a wide number of different variables or variables working together over time. And lakes are very resilient, uh, uh, dynamic systems, and so it's rare to see the aquatic plant community the same from one year to the next, really anywhere. Yeah, we could we could probably have twenty more PhD dissertations on exactly that different aspects of that that question. So. Good one. Um, uh, Grace asks, what's the best way to preserve an aquatic plant specimen for later ID? And I will turn your attention to the, the chat where Michelle has linked detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to press and dry aquatic plants. That's going to be on page 25 to 28 of um, the protocol that she links that's hosted on the UW Stevens Point site, on UW, um, Extension Lake site. And I will also add that in the handout packet that you got today, there is a one sheet description on how to press an aquatic plant. The biggest difference is that you stick the water right, the paper right under the water and float the plant onto it and then uh, gently pull it out. So yeah, if we had been live, we would have demonstrated. But anyway, hopefully you can learn how to do it. Thanks, Susan. That's, that's one of our usual rotations in the in-person workshops that we'd actually demonstrate how to float out a plant to press it. Um, it's one of those things that we just sort of had to cut out for today, but ordinarily we would have a, an 8.30 to 5 in-person workshop on this topic, and we'd repeat that several times over the summer. So it's just a different format this year with all of our current challenges. For sure. Um, Matt has uh, put a link in to the EdMaps that, that folks were just talking about, um, where you can look at the distribution of all invasives. It's a very useful site. Um, okay, I wanted to um, put out there some quick clarifying information on that audio piece on Eurasian water milfoil management in the north woods of Wisconsin uh, that I mentioned earlier. It's going to air tomorrow on WXPR Rhinelander at 6.45, 8.45, and 5.45. It's going to be 91.7 FM if you're using internet radio or you live in northern Wisconsin, and it'll be available also in its entirety on WXPR.org. So certainly check that out if you are thinking a lot about Eurasian water milfoil management in your life. Um, I think I've gotten to everything. Uh, leads, if, if you see a question that I've missed, please feel free to just go ahead and pick it up. 
do see one that just came in um, okay. talking about succession of aquatic plant communities. Um, yes, there is a natural succession that takes time, uh, takes place in lakes. Typically, um, there are some species that show up first in man-made ponds. If you think of like a mini golf course, um, I'm guilty of maybe intentionally hitting my mini golf ball occasionally into a pond to look into, look at the aquatic plants growing there. Uh, but you will see things like the slender naiad, a um, couple of cara species. Those are very early, uh, I don't want to call them invaders, but basically the, the first ones to show up in uh, man-made systems. Um, and some of those annual species are the first ones to come in. So the caras, the naiads, things like that. Leafy pondweed is a very common one that shows up very early in a, the life of a lake. And then over time, you start to see a lot more perennials. So you see these large beds of large leaf pondweed or white stem pondweed and a much more diverse assemblage of aquatic plants. So that's a typical succession of an aquatic system. Um, Christine asked about the the chat being Thank you. sorry. <laughs> Thank you. The recording and the chat is recorded as a transcript. Um, I think we've been we've been talking uh, through the chat questions pretty well, so I think they're conveyed in the audio of the recording. So we probably don't need to worry about sharing the transcript of the chat. Um, but the recording is still going, so the entire webinar and the Q&A here at the end is all being recorded and that will all be shared with you. Well, if people want to access the links that we've been sharing, um, are they, I am able to save the chat on my screen. I'm happy to share that with Christine and anyone else who's interested, but are folks able to save the chat using those three buttons on their interfaces as well? I'm not familiar enough with Zoom. Um, Sometimes you can copy and paste out of the chat, so you may be able to highlight all the text and copy it out. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that as far as the transcript of the chat goes. So I can send that out. There is a transcript that is recorded, and so um, I will send out the transcript of the chat so you have those links. Oh, it looks like Joe reports the three dots in the window that you use to type into the chat interface allows you to save your own version of the transcript. So if you're interested in preserving the conversation and the links, please use those that uh, function to, to save it on your own machine. Let me know if you're having any problems. Perfect, thank you for that. I see that now at the bottom of the chat box. Um, Chris had mentioned the short-term plant ID. You can put a little water in the plant in a Ziploc bag and store in the fridge. That is definitely true. Um, some plants last longer than others, but typically you can get at least a few days out of it. If you just put the plant into a little bit of water in the fridge, you can deliver it to somebody or take a picture of it and send it to one of us for ID or um, other people in your respective states to help you with ID. Looks like we're keeping Tracy from budgeting work. Sorry, not sorry, Tracy. <laughs> okay, and Anna reports some, some difference in the functionality of that button. Um, she's using a Chromebook. Uh, so anyone who's not able to save the chat, just let me know and I can get you the information. Um, I'd like to quickly mention something that folks living in Wisconsin might be interested in. Um, you may be familiar with the fact that over the last year or so, we've been working toward what we're calling APTA, the Aquatic Plant Taxonomic Assurance Program. So, um, you know, the instructors have all worked together to um, curate these workshops and provide usually outside of COVID, um, hands-on experiences to get to know and learn to identify the aquatic plants in Wisconsin. We've added onto that workshop recently a test so folks can, can attend and um, absorb the content and then take a taxonomic test at the end of the workshop 
to kind of solidify um, and, and gain assurance for their tax taxonomic ability. We are not providing in-person workshops this year, so we're not providing that aquatic plant taxonomic assurance test. Um, you know, our plan is kind of long, long term to provide that option for people who are interested. And then, you know, UW Wisconsin um, or UW Stevens Point, the Extension Lakes program could maintain a list of assured providers on their website. So folks would, you know, be able to kind of celebrate their ability to identify aquatic plants and provide services that are related. In addition, um, we would require for grant funded work those assurances um, it, to be in place before the survey happens. So folks who are conducting grant funded surveys would need to be assured providers. Since we can't provide in-person workshops, we are postponing all of that um, for the entire rest of the year. So what that means is essentially um, with respect to the grant program, we're pushing back the taxonomic assurance program by about two years. So we will be providing, hopefully, in-person training next year, and then that would translate to assurances being required for grant deliverables in the following year. So training to be provided in 2021 and assurance to be required for grant funded work in 2022. All right, that's all on, on APTA. If you have any questions about the assurance, uh, contact Paul Squinsky or myself. And I think we've worked through most of the questions. I think we are all caught up. So we'll just give it a minute here if there's any final questions, otherwise we'll wrap it up. Looks like we were able to reach a few people that otherwise would not be able to make it. So that's great. Glad to hear that. All right, well, thank you all for joining. Uh, was, we still have 121 people hanging in there with us till the very end. So that's awesome. We were up to about 230 there at the beginning. Um, so thank you all for joining and Again, if you have unknown aquatic plant photos that you'd like to send us, we'd certainly be happy to help out with those. And uh, maybe we'll see you next year in an in-person workshop. So have a great rest of your day. Bye.